Welcome to Return to Form. We are here to discuss a bet noir of ours, British cinema. British cinema. The cinema yeah. of the land that we are Li- speaking to you from. Literally from. Um, and we are from. We are British. Born, we are Brits, as some people Brits-ish. say. Brits-ish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, there are various layers, various aspects to the malaise, the problem, the disease of British cinema. It's been referred to... Uh, by many people, we're not the only people to think that this is a huge issue. I think it's a commonly held belief that, um, in a, in a kind of blunt way, British film punches uh, below its weight class. Yeah, yeah if you every, think all other things being equal, Britain mm-hmm. is a major world economy. I hate to be materialist about it, but we're a major world economy, huge population of leaders in theatre. And culture, culture, and literature, but science, <laughs> science, uh, GCSE English, yeah. But everything else, like everything else, you know, seemed to be pretty prominent yeah. in. But when it comes to film, there's a huge problem, which is that a lot of mm. the the British directors um, uh, who are good, or even just the ones that are successful, mm. uh, people like Steve McQueen, uh, Christopher Nolan, yeah. uh, the Scott brothers, Ridley and Tony. Oh, um, yeah, of course, uh, lots uh, of Yanks, yeah, lots uh, of strange. No. Um, uh, cases of of um, British directors uh, going abroad, mm. uh, Nick Rogue. Uh, they're, some get, they're getting embraced by the sort of Moss Film Hollywood complex, yeah. as you know Goddard referred to it. And I think uh, you don't really get that. And you know, uh, to be honest, like Hollywood has always captured directors. You know, we were chatting mm-hmm. now over dinner about Peter Sostrom in in from Sweden in the twenties. You know, Victor so Sostrom. Victor Sostrom. Sorry, mm-hmm. who's uh, the Peter? I don't know, I just invented him. Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang. Many directors from Germany, Lubitsch, went yeah. to America, of course. For and they went for money. You know, they went for reasons. money. They went for the possibilities of California. They went for this nascent film industry. But the thing is, what they and left behind... To get behind, away from Nazi Germany. Get away from Nazi Germany. It's quite important. Very important. But what there remained a rump of film culture and film production and film energy in those countries that may, m- meant that those countries continued to produce uh, film. They might have had a, a few, you know, sort of Sweden recovered its film industry. You know, Ingmar Bergman ushered in a kind of new revival. Uh, yeah, Germany lost many of its directors, but it had new German cinema. It had, yeah. you know, sort of uh, Fassbinder. It had all the Kluger. It had all these people that we now think of, you know, has a solid, and I think in my head when I think about it, I say, you think about any other country um, in this, this wide world of ours, and mm-hmm. you can say Japan, Hungary, Italy, Spain, Iran, Iran. Poland, Taiwan. Yeah. And you they've all at the very least had their moments mm, in cinema. They've had a dominant world world wrapping wave. And you can picture the, the, the kind of tenor or the cadence of the film. It has like a mouthfeel, the film in that country. But when you think about British film, you're like... Well, it has a mouthfeel. Oh. And we're going to discuss that mouthfeel. But... Potato peelings. It's... Um, it's a bad mm. mouthfeel. It tastes. Yeah. British films taste bad. They're unpleasant to watch. Uh, they're <laughs> drab. Um, they're not very cinematic. Um, they don't really understand what cinema does. Um, Interesting. They're ugly. They're uh, politically um, pretentious. Mm. Dogmatic. Yeah, dogmatic. Know, often, I think. Uh, but I think you know the one thing people know about British film is the you know the kitchen sink drama and we will get yeah. into that um and that's had its own revival you know we're in a country in the world that's had you know a, 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 not only kitchen sink drama but a kitchen sink revival uh, yes. period as well which i mean is, we I think we went ba- back for more basically british cinema has followed similar trends to other countries uh, except we have a completely wrong idea about what our kind of heyday and our heritage is mm. so uh, you know other countries have their sort of grand moments like the French New Wave, and then they'll sort of, rev- you know, France. Then you've got these, the these cinema decor. These moments later. of revival, yeah. yeah, yeah. We ha- we thought we had a kind of new wave, and we'll discuss this shortly. Mm. Um, at, but it was crap, and it was l- it was not very it was not very interesting, and yeah. we just kept reviving that same. Yeah, we and we still are. Flog the dead horse. Exactly. Away. There's lots of moments at which British cinema, kind of, has an opportunity to flourish and doesn't. You know, there was a filmmaker Cecil Hepworth. Um, who created this film, uh, Waiting for Rover? What's it called? Uh, yeah, it's a book. About, it's a film. About, it's a short film about a dog. It's about yeah. a minute long, um, and it's uh, it's got a kind of um, a quaintness to it, and it does innovate narrative uh, technique quite well. well also, Roundhead, Roundhead Garden, Garden, Roundhead Garden, Roundhead Garden eighteen eighty eight. The actual first film is two seconds long, made in Leeds by a Frenchman, mm. but. You know, there there was a chance yeah. in these two films and others 
to see the possibility of a kind of a Britain being the furnace in which cinema was forged or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, didn't happen. Partly, there Holly, our relation, our special relation to America, got in the way, and a lot of Hollywood studios block booked the oh. British cinemas in a way that was just prohibitive for those films to be shown and therefore yeah. for them ever to really get made. Yeah, there's, there's a production context and a money context behind this and I think, you know, the actual conditions under which British films distributed and made are important. But I think there's also star flight as well. You know, the nice yeah. the thing about the relationship between the UK and America is that we both speak English yeah. and the arrival of the talkie meant it was very easy for British film stars to gravitate to where the real money was and the real sex was and the real yeah. appeal, you know, pre-code Hollywood where anything could be made. Um, and Britain never really had an equivalent. We couldn't keep people like Louise Brooks, you know, because she British, British, yeah. Wow, yeah, crazy. Cary Grant as well from like Grant, yeah. from what, Bristol or something. Anyway, yeah. so we we there's this, this there's this leaky faucet, um, yeah, kind of story behind all of this at various points. Actually, at every point in British yeah. uh, filmmaking, we are losing. I say we in this kind of blood and soil way, but I don't mean it in that way. But that we are like losing uh, talent. talent. Um, yeah. you know, technical talent, like, you know, sort of behind the camera talent. We're losing directors, cinematographers, we're also losing like actors. Um, and it's still a case, you know, some of our greatest actors now, people like James Corden, uh, going to America <laughs> to... Yeah. It um, was crazy sorry. when The Wild came out and um, mm. like almost all the actors in it were British. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's and then even like, Dominic su- West. Even like Succession, yeah. which is like a sort of British show. In America. Mm. Anyway. Ian <coughs> um, McShane went to America. Yeah, so, sorry, anyway. This isn't TV. But chat. yeah, this so... Is, um, we have we have this we have this silent era thirties context uh, in which cinema is neglected. We then have the ah so we've got a, we've missed a um, key we, uh, strut here, which is basically British documentary cinema making. Ah yes yeah yeah. So for a time in the in the in the twenty late Humphrey Jennings. Uh, talking about Humphrey Jennings, but I'm also talking about like uh, why have I why has my brain gone fucking dead? John Grissom. John Grissom. Of course. Talking yeah. people like John Grissom and, and the British film. BBC film, what would later become the BBC Nightmare, British all film that stuff, unit. Yeah, yeah. So GPA. Man of Aaron. Mm-hmm. There was a time when the British social realist documentary, um, which was cinematically innovative, yeah. um, was documentarian, but wasn't dogmatic, had an interesting relationship to its kind of subject matter, was lyrical, it was poetic, it was very interesting, really energetic. Um, that, I suppose, in a way, the re- problem with that was it had a always slightly paternalistic well it was an informational yeah, it, it yeah. had an inf- you, you say lyrical and it's true but mm. it ultimately served informational ends yeah it was really like an extension it was like you know which in the russian context you know i guess like interesting filmmaking was able to happen through well, Einstein were exactly through conventional it's, organs it's weird production. though it's different because there there's like there's a different relationship to its subject matter whereas in britain I think actually no, maybe it was intent because you know Russian cinema was trying it to to activate the inherent revolutionary dynamic potential in its audience. Whereas yeah. in Britain, it's like, well, most of the people live here are living in in sin and shit covered hovels. We need to like remind them that you know think about about the basics of commonality in civil society. It's a different relationship between the the producers and the people they were making films for. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but then with you know. Actually, some great experiments have been made in the UK, like Len Lai, his GPO, yeah, his yeah, general yeah. post office films are incredible. You know, there's like there have been really formally formally innovative yeah. experimental films made under the aegis of um uh you know, sort of government propaganda or information films. Yeah, like they it. slip through the cracks. There is a yeah. sort of there is and we will return to this, there is a sort of mu- mu- municipal culture industry that used to exist and and basically and definitely doesn't now yeah uh through which interesting stuff was made um through national broadcasting or, or what yeah. have you um and and so that is a that is a tendency that was exploited by interesting people at certain points um then the the, the war the interwar and and post-war era um it's very studio dominated you have the rank organization and you have um I love that name. Rank, absolutely rank, right. <laughs> and you have you have various um, a small handful of studios, Ealing Studios, uh, who produce these these um, charming comedies. Delightful, no, it's sometimes very interesting. Yeah, it kind of Coronets is fantastic, yeah, yeah. but it's as fantastic as a great TV show. I mean, it's not it's a cottage industry. Yeah, exactly. Know, minor. It's a minor. It's, it's what you know. It's a well, 
to losing the guitar, you gas it up. But when you talk about a minor literature, it's like operating in a minor, very minor mode, yeah. which can produce really interesting things. You know, they the Lady Killers is pretty, is, yeah, it's, it's kind of quite, um, it's a bit bolder. And then he, he went to America, like McKendrick. Yeah. He writes a great book actually about filmmaking. Which but I think when, when you when you look at like Ealing comedies, when you look at these kind of bigger productions as well, so you're looking obviously at Powell and Pressburger. So that's um, what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. So there's this crux where we've got we're producing brilliant melodramas, a uh, very high budget, enormously popular actually. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, so we, we're in the time of David Lean and Powell and Pressburger. Just before, the, like okay. you know, because what happens is we have this 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 kind of uh, insular explosion which mm-hmm. is Powell and Pressburger and yeah. that kind of melodrama and then by the time we get into like the late 50s and 60s uh that um energy shifts in a way because mm-hmm. we're producing these David Lean massive biopics yeah. and so on you know we're producing massive films that are globally really popular um but the vast and you've also got Merchant not, Ivory yeah, yeah. you've got all these kind of big things but they are funded by America yeah they're kind of produced for an American audience yeah. really you know there's that famous uh was it seventies or eighties where they there's that Oscar, you know, Britain British directors and producers and so on won like fourteen, twenty Oscars. Just the something. British are coming thing. The British are coming. Yeah. But this was um, in the seventies. Seventies, much later. Right, yeah. But there's this idea where and we will talk about uh, Lindsay Anson soon, but there's he you know, one of the things he is right about mm-hmm. is that the British are not coming because a lot of the money and the financing and the talent and the equipment, yada, 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 is coming from America. And these things are primed for an American audience. And also these are big budget Hollywood blockbuster films. Yeah, and so also it just, interesting. it reinforces the supremacy of America to say the British are coming. Coming to where? America. Not interesting. Yeah. The British should be flourishing in Britain. Not Exactly. Not to, not, <laughs> not to take a kind <laughs> of uh, Farageist sort of tone. But it, it is, yeah. most countries are able to produce a healthy homegrown what film culture. What do you culture. think Nigel Farage's favourite film is? Um... It's probably with Nan and I or something. It's very, you know, like Zulu that, or like Great Escape. Could be, yeah, yeah, it could be Great Escape. Yeah. Maybe he just likes John Wayne Weston. That would make sense. He's uh, kind, you know, he kind, kind of, of wa- now, he kind of yeah. wants Britain to be America. Yeah. Um, anyway, Doug Russian. Exactly. Um, yes. So, so there's a, there's the Powell and Pressburger films, which for for whatever reason, I think one of the main reasons is because they, you could say like one of them was Hungarian, so that brought in like a kind of a superior European Im- European influence. Uh, I think also uh, they worked as producer, writer, director together. They did oh. everything. They, they controlled the means of production. They were kind of sui generis in this. Oh. They didn't operate. They had a different relationship to the studio. Well, they were independent industry, filmmakers in a way. Exactly. But they, they yeah. managed to access big budgets and they had a sense of spectacle that was literary. A lot of their work was based on books, but it was, um, yeah, it was grand. It, it captured the grandness of that post-war, war, mm. slightly pre-war era. Um, and it was, yeah, it was romantic and, and bold and it doesn't really, and you know, I don't, I don't love, love their films, but that, you know, watch the, watching them is a, is a, it's always a very warm, exactly. pleasurable experience to watch their films. You know, you're not, you, you're not, it's not like watching Douglas Sirk, you know, you're not thinking this is very pr- profound, ecstatic melodrama like mm-hmm. watching and something different with Douglas Sirk. You don't feel like you're watching, I don't know. It, there's That's an very, interesting point about yeah. Sirk. Because, yeah, like, why mm. did... Because Cirque feels inherently, like, soldered into the history of cinema. Cirque has got a very dark underbelly, though. There's right. something very... I feel with Cirque. Cirque... Cirque allows, like, Lynch to do Twin Peaks, right? Like, right. Uh, there's... A, like, yeah. I feel like there's an anticipation. When you watch a Cirque um, melodrama, there's something icky and unpleasant about it, which is why Fassbinder loved him so much. Yeah. You know, Fassbinder yeah, yeah. writes this amazing piece for New Left Review... Or it was republished in New Left Review years later. It was in New Left Review. And he he gasses yeah. up Cirque in a massive Crazy. way. And it really makes sense where you're like, okay, the reason Fassbinder liked Cirque was the thorny edginess of these melodramas. Yeah. And the thing is, Powell and Pressburger don't have a duck. Even if the story is like, you know, sort of like the Red Shoes or Black Narcissus or whatever, it's still... Oh, it's righto. Oh, right 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 yeah, there's something right. about it's Roger, really Roger Lipsy. I mean, Colonel Blimp, is that your favourite Powell and Pressburger? It's kind. It's kind of one of the big ones, isn't it? I and like. I think Black Narcissus is incredible. It's like the Black Narcissus. Is, it does it's have the, the closest. Darkness. It yeah, has yeah, a darkness, yeah. and it's the closest we got to making something really cinematically important <laughs> in that period. I think. Th- there but is I love a Colonel sense. Blimp. It's great. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a sense. There's a sense of the like lovely uncle, the lovely, um, the lovely patrician, uh, and we'll talk again about patrician energy and about colonialism, you know, f- further along in the discussion. But um, yeah, there's like a sense of 
of, of family warmth and, and reassurance during hard times, like sort of dealing with dealing with the instability of the world. Gathering through, around the wireless. Exactly, gathering around know. the wireless, tuning in. And, you know, Matter of Life and Death is totally about, like, trying to find um, warmth in humanity. In the a, triumph of, of yeah. love and civic duty. Exactly. Uh, above all... Um, and it's very rousing, and it's and it is mm. very cinematically rendered. So, I, I on on paper, Although I can't Churchill hated that film. Did he? Well, yeah, but he was because it sympathetically depicts a German officer. Oh, uh, a German officer. Mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean they're obviously more dialectical than a Winston <laughs> Churchill speech, but <laughs> they still, yeah, <laughs> they still, um, they still leave a bit to be desired. And you're right; it's mm. it's cinema, like pure cinema, like has to kind of have within its purview, like. Mm. I, I, that that di- that strain of difficulty and tension, and, and I suppose America, America has never had any trouble. Um, America maybe being like a, a vicious and, and precarious place in many mm. ways, with it with its own like happy, uh, sincere veneer, manages to ride that line with such ease. Yeah, but I think Cirque with America, Lynch. any this is this is me speculating wildly, but any country that's founded, uh, you know, with a constitution and set of ideals has a permanent you know sort of baseline to measure itself its success and its failure against yeah. you know any other country britain included that has emerged and evolved over thousands of years it's much harder to kind of identify that you haven't got a permanent barometer of what you know success what looks about like. france there they're basically as old as we are yeah but they still have there's so many traditions that predate the revolution that continue mm. you know catholicism for example you know but still also they a had a revolution role. they had a revolution britain had a revolution but it was you know not really effective uh it was too soon it was a failed revolution failed they revolution. needed to have multiple ones like france had multiple france had like what four republics five and they're republics still now? fucking weird but yeah like, you know. but i think there's like you know I, this is me speculating widely, a, king, but, a dying king yeah but america has a <laughs> yeah america has a you know a constant barometer to, to you know there's the ideal america that's very easy to bounce off and the uk thing is the uk has the class system which television and film is obsessed with either to reinforce or to undermine the thing is when it has undermined it it's undermined it in a way that's reinforced it think about things like monty python yeah, yeah, yeah. they playfully s- satirically um you know sort of play up and send up the class system as if it's this uh immovable object i mean you know, even that's gone with comedy or, yeah like class-based comedy went from the establishment sending itself up uh in the 60s and 70s mm. to um sort of lower middle class people attacking the working class yeah. with little britain and stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it's now like and now the comedy just isn't really about class um no which i think is i mean you have to talk about the thing that's dominant in the ri- you know what i mean so it's, mm. it's, it's, it's it has to be approached somehow but so so f- speaking from class and we'll return to class i keep saying i'm trailing all these it's a, such a multifaceted discussion we're trying to yeah we're trying to encompass a, a hundred and 25 30 years of filmmaking yeah. into an hour and a half but in this moment so. in cinema where you have these kind of um wartime wartime jolly grand affairs that are funded a lot by america yeah uh and this is the sort of 50s uh, a bunch of filmmakers who work in the documentary field are restless for something um more dynamic more authentic mm. Um, and this is at a time when cameras are becoming lighter, more portable. Uh, in Italy, you have Italian neorealism. In France, you have the French New Wave. Um, in America, you have John Cassavetes and, mm. and a sort of a new kind of the invention of indie cinema um, and also experimental avant garde in America. Mm. Um, even in Japan, you have a kind of like self-aware, self-conscious new wave as well. You know, whether films shot in and you know in by foreign directors in Japan or you know Japanese directors making them Teshigahara later. Mm. You know, so you've got a lot of countries are beginning to, and a lot of it reflects kind of bourgeois ennui, yeah. ennui, I should say. Um, a lot of it reflects kind of uh, dissipation. The kind of spectre of nuclear war, yeah, yeah. all of these things. The cinema is liberated, yeah, liberated in lots of these places. And there's a moment where we think it's being liberated in Britain, and we're now going to explain why it wasn't. <laughs> well, because so this is this is where one of our, you know, uh, a figure like a lot of people will be familiar with, uh, Lindsay Anderson, um, yeah. comes in. So Lin- Lindsay Anderson, you mentioned the free cinema movement. There, there are kind of two. It's almost like a back and forth here. There's two things. There's the free cinema movement. And then there's what might, in a broader sense, be termed the kind of you know, British new wave. 
um, yeah. you know, kind of it's a more Which expansive Which is the, wo- the Woodfall films, basically. Yeah. So by free cinema, we mean actually quite an intentioned community uh which Lindsay Anson spearheaded uh, along with Carol Rice and some other uh, filmmakers. There was a manifesto, quite a, a, yeah. you know, a bullish manifesto, which was, like you said, was an attempt to f- liberate uh, filmmaking from kind of stiff, upper-lipped, kind of starched, collared um, deference to authority, to kind of sentimentality. It was to show real stories of real people and show truth, life as it really is. It's yeah, the yeah. way you frame the it. Poeti- the poetics of the everyday. The poetics of the everyday. And the thing is, for them, a lot of the films that constituted the free cinema movement were the first documentaries. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Lindsay Anson made like a film about, it's not Margate, it's like Blackpool. It um, is Margate, actually. It yeah. is Margate, yeah, yeah. So they're like showing working class lives um, uh, as they are, working class traditions. They're... Not, you know, they're not necessarily like poverty porn. I think they kind of are in a way, but they'd also show, you know, kind of like Morris dancers and uh, penny arcades and that kind of thing. They're showing yeah. how do the working classes spend their time? What are the working classes like? They're What's like it like to be a railway signal signalman? You know, those. The most generous thing you could say about these films is that they provide like a catalog for the archives of. And I think. Parfait. Ev- yeah, yeah, and ev- exactly. Parfait, like stock yeah. footage. Like yeah. every era should be recorded I, th- I believe that's true 100% yeah. but they're not um, Hot miles. yeah they're not like uh, exciting films no they're there's, like, there's w- nothing dynamic about they're them. not made interestingly I mean they're n- but inherently are made a bit interestingly because they're made with portable cameras and so mm. compared to what came before they've got this there's like no like energy a editing with, with them editing is like here's something else exactly. here's something else there's no kind of it's not analytical editing. and he says there's we no, weren't uh, interested in technique We weren't interested in technique, except as a means of expression. What we wanted to do was to get ordinary, uncelebrated life on the screen. A concert party given by minors' children in a Yorkshire village. We'll we'll play this, we'll drop it in here in the the video. This this scene where Lindsay Anderson's defending the free cinema movement. He says, we we weren't interested in technique. Yeah. Um, we, it, we we were looking to um, capture life as it was, as yeah. it is. Kind of the words he was using, and the thing is, there wasn't an interrogatory perspective. And again, there was something kind of paternalistic about it. As much as they thought they were rejecting the kind of BBC World Service, exactly. In a way, they were kind of reproducing it because they were acting like ethnographers um, who were going out to. They were leaving. You know, we're leaving Knightsbridge and Mayfair. And we're going to go out. Mm. And we're going to see what it's like. Uh, in Blackpool and we're going to see what it's like in, in Bradford and we're going to go and film some stuff and isn't this fascinating mm. and yeah it, it produces an interesting documentary effect but the thing is there's no interpretation of that and there's no challenge of that and there's no sense of interiority with those films whereas when you've got I don't know like in France I think I know I talk about Jean Daniel Paulet all the time but 1958 Jean Daniel Paulet makes a film called At Least We Are Drunk or At Least We Will Be Drunk which is kind of about uh real largely working class like discotheques in uh that were very popular in the 50s um and but he has a kind of like you know there are real people dancing at this discotheque it's kind of a study of working class entertainment and sex and longing but it has a character played by claude melke and it kind of you know he doesn't talk in it he's just a kind of uh almost like a a fetish actor in a way you just kind of see his reactions as he tries to kind of like hook up with people and is rebuffed and so Mm -hmm. on and so on and so on but there isn't this is like pretty new wave in a way Here's an attempt to show, capture and document working class life, whatever, like normal life, um, but also to inject it with a little bit of interiority, a little bit of challenge. Uh, There's also a sense of it's saying something about the modern subject and about longing and loss and so on. But whereas you watch these films, you're like, oh, that's a kind of cool depiction of Margate that would be lost otherwise in the 1950s. But you're not taking anything from it you're not your your sense of perception isn't being deranged or shaken Mm. up in any way you're just like oh this is just a camera pointed at the thing that's happening which our eyes do all the time exactly there's no cinema there i think is the yeah i mean they they, 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 it's overtaken by a politics of representation it's like id polar it's just like that you should think this is good because of the people it represents yeah and and therefore by by being by being judged on those metrics yeah it it can't possibly risk actually investigating the interiority of those people they're not they don't actually have interiority yeah, they're yeah. just like happy marionettes they're dancing in a club mm. or playing at the thing doing punch and judy and it's like oh look these people exist yeah. and then maybe some middle class people see it and go well these people exist i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> now in fairness um 
the 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 fiction movement that follow the fiction feature film movement that follows more interesting, yeah. uh, the Woodfall films are basically Lindsay Anderson makes this film This Sporting Life with Richard Harris, who then goes off to <laughs> Italy to be in Red Desert the following year. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a film amazing, about amazing. a kind of angry young man. They, they talk about the angry young men kind of movement. Uh, it's a which is a, th- a theatrical. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's you know um, John Osborne all these exactly. Yeah. Theater, but yeah, it's it's a it's a film about an Don't angry young an man from a working class background um, who who gets his um, lights punched out in a rugby match and uh lots of sh- sort of angry shouting scenes quite an interesting like rug scene at it's the beginning just with the EastEnders rugby in black and white really isn't it yeah yeah i mean with yeah. a bit more a little bit more <laughs> stylistic flair but not enough yeah. to really write home about um and and this was meant to be the kind of the abu de souffle you know of, of britain at this point i mean you have that you have saturday night and sunday morning um you know which has like a voiceover at the loneliness start. of a long distance loneliness runner, of a long distance uh, runner. Yeah. they're films that kind of like obviously take this further step with their subject matter of like trying mm. to identify the emotion of 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 the working class subject but we still don't really get interiority with them yeah you know, we're still kind of just getting or these rather, people have emotions i don't yeah i don't isn't the same it's a mixture of it's too work. much and not enough interiority right because mm. it's like I don't mind watching a, a, a French film where I don't really know what's going... Like, why well, don't mind watching Bresson? You don't have, like, no interiority in Bresson. True. But you're yeah. able to, like... You're allowed to speculate and yeah, you're allowed to, like, be around these people. Do they allow you in? It's almost like they give way. too much, like... Mm. The, 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 um, the dialogue is very on the nose always. It's always like, I'm in this situation because of what th- this happened. I'm angry about this. You promised me this exactly. and in reality you're yeah, doing yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And so and I'm w- the sort of person that feels like this because of yeah. my what I've been through. Um, and this, this, but this is about as interesting as that form of, I mean, no one has ever made social realism more interesting than the Woodfall films. And yeah, they weren't even that good. No. They're like after that, it tails off into Ken Loach. And like yeah. films made for charity, films made to basically the old oak. Yeah, <laughs> like is, I mean, yeah. it goes all the way to all the oak. It starts with that cares and Kathy come home. And these films that are about mm. making sure that we know that poverty exists and that we think of pov- poor people as being noble. And it's really mm. an inversion of uh, of the logic, the colonial logic that that, that it's reacting against, because it's providing a, a kind of a a, 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 simp- a a simplistic view of 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 people based on mm. on where they're from who they and are actually w- whereas like a, a more radical idea is to suggest is to do something that i suppose eisenstein or vertov or pudovkin or anyone who figured out you know years and years before that um that uh it's not enough simply to show um the world you have to kind of like show what perception itself is like and mm-hmm. to begin to dismantle perception and these films don't really do that um they actually you know lindsay anderson does at times, you know, there's a in the sporting life. There's a big like this thing I call this big like Eastendery argument scene in it, oh, yeah. but it's very shot reverse shot. You know, it's kind of marriage yeah. stories. It's, it, it, you it know, is. It's, it's really yeah. kind of it's. And that's actually one of the best yeah. films in this. I actually quite like that scene when I watched it in context. Then I saw it again in this documentary. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my god, it's not bad. Like this, it's, so this, this, this sporting <laughs> life is fine, but in in if that's the best that we can exactly. surface from that period, when you've got like in France, you've got. 50 films that mm. are you know better than that you know so at the same time you have around the same um, time or slightly later you have um joseph losey who's obviously been exiled from america mm. he makes some pretty good genre flicks mm. um maybe a little bit earlier you have carol reed who makes the third man yeah we need to talk about third man. so third man was actually voted uh there was a list done a few years ago um which was sight and sound did a top british 100, 100 top British films and it's quite a predictable list in some ways you know towards the top you have got sort of Lawrence of Arabia and so on but mm-hmm. the top of that list is The Third Man oh, really? um, which is interesting so Carol Reed was a, a, a British director um, obviously it was shot in in, in, in Germany um, in Austria Austria in sorry Vienna. in Vienna um, with Orson Welles and I can't help it's so Wellesian I, I would need to watch more Carol Reed yeah there's Reed. a lot of deep focus there's a lot of stark so Orson Welles sort of expressionist night. shadow yeah. it's but at the same time you know um, it's a terrific flick. Although, by all accounts, so having read the Wells biography, I'm pretty sure at the time Wells was bouncing around Europe on various funding ventures. So I think he turned up for his. I think a lot of the pre production, a lot mm. of the shooting had already happened. Uh, okay. So I think the he, doesn't, start he isn't in most of the film. Yeah. So I think. Spoiler. There's also a good. Yeah. <laughs> there's also a good chance that, um, you know, maybe Cowrie had seen 
uh, Citizen Kane yeah. and gone, I want to make something like that with that visual. Yeah. That's, that's no bad thing. You know, it's like Citizen Kane, super, probably one of the most influential films ever made in some ways. Yeah. So uh, it's not a, no mistake that he then, you know, wanted Orson Welles to appear in it. And maybe yeah. when Orson Welles was on set, knowing he was a big bully beef, that he probably did suggest mm-hmm. some shots that Carol Reed included. But yeah, Carol Reed is kind of a weird outlier in a way because... Yeah, is maybe the third man is one of the best British films ever made in in that capacity, but it it, do, it is does at the same time feel quite derivative of Wells. And yeah, the noir it doesn't feel and, and and it doesn't feel like a distinctive British effort, I suppose. No, and, and I think what we're searching for and what we'll talk about later in our in our second section um, is the. Uh, is the sort of the, the exceptions to the rule or the exceptions that prove the rule. Yeah, we will have some good... There are lots we, of good films. We will give you out. a kind of alternative canon can for I, British in a, in, 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 While you say that, can you give me a Of course, of course, of course. This is thirsty work. Cahor. Uh We're going for the Cahor now, but, um the black wine. Um, so I think... Thank you. Um, so I should have mic'd that. For, for this yeah, list. for a fact, we can follow that in. Uh, <laughs> what, I wa- what I want to do though is I, I do want to go back and... It, is this... At various points in... Um, no, let's continue on this 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 tread actually. So we go through the kind of sixties and seventies. We get these low C films. We get the kind of these big budget historical epics that we've alluded to. Lawrence of Arabia being, yeah, yeah. you know, sort of uh, first among them. In a way, they're like big albatrosses. Yeah. You get Merchant <laughs> Ivory. Merchant yeah. Ivory, super influential, but kind of pap. And actually, most Merchant Ivory films failed at the box office. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything about Merchant Ivory, actually. Is it like Shakespeare or something? Well, it did like... So what you... No, 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 not, not Shakespeare at all. They were like often adaptations or historical epics yeah. um, or studies. Yeah, Howard's End is a very late one. Um, you know, sort of like what you'd now call prestige drama, I suppose, right. Merchant Ivory mm-hmm. did. But they were like c- competent and good. But I think increasingly um, they just trundled on for ages. And I think Merchant Ivory sometimes struggled to really like reap the rewards of what they were doing. Yeah. Trying to, I think a lot of Merchant Ivory's like um, production methodology was, they had a couple of successes. So Gandhi was a Merchant Ivory film. Okay. Um, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm 90% sure of that. Um, and then that was really successful. So they'd be like, oh, what about this historical figure? And mm. the American audience would go, oh, I don't give a shit about that. And they'd lose loads of money. <laughs> And, Always know, in Hawks the Americans. Yeah, very much in Hawks the it's Americans. It's hard to develop so. our own tastes. I feel that's a big mm. problem. Um, there's a sort of 60s counterculture cinema and the British Film Institute in the 60s and 70s funds some kind of odd things. I mean, they fund Deep End by... I think they fund Deep End by Scott and Moscow. There's a sort of... The BFI did this DVD series about 10 years ago mm. called Flipside where they sort of released these various... The Bed Sitting Room... Um, and uh, Herostratus, that very oh, sinister yeah. kind of film about a man who sells his suicide to an addict. You see, oh yeah, because we're kind of forgetting that there are, yeah. W- by talking about Scott Mosk and Deep End, we get Ameri- we get foreigners coming to the UK yeah, yeah, to make yeah. really fucking good films. Yeah, like yeah. Blow yeah. Up. I mean, I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> Love is like on. an Italian film, but yeah. it's like in London <laughs> in this very weird way. But we should talk about that as part. It's so Deep funny. Deep End is filmed in Germany. Yeah, it's like barely a British film, but there are Jane Asher's in it. Has these British actors? Yes, she is. Um, yes. Uh yeah, so there's like and there's like performance, Nick Rogue, Donald Camel. So there are some some fresh spurts of talent emerging. Yeah, Don't Look Now is an extraordinary film. Um very odd film, actually. It's it, it really interestingly odd actually. Um Yeah, and quite Britishly odd, I would I would have to I would say. Yeah, but it's like it's like that's our So Don't Look Now is our Mulholland and Drive. Uh, in what's yeah, we have to be careful with these analogies. I don't care. I said it. <laughs> um, but it <laughs> I think they're quite different films. They are really different yeah. films. But you know, there's there's, no, there's never been like a no one's ever done like an experimental narrative like Mulholland mm-hmm. Drive in the British context. But it juts out. It's like I a little. They have. Yeah, I don't know. Just, done it. I actually think some of these weird films in the sixties, like really weird ones like Herostratus, mm. kind of they're so off the wall. Mm. I mean, there's there's like Jack Bond and Jane Arden. You know that really that you know separation and anti clock and I'm not seeing separation. the other side of underneath there this this couple I don't think they're a couple but like this, these collaborators Jane Arden and Jack Bond I think Jane Arden was like in and out of the loony bin all the time but oh. like they were like they made really wacky formerly mad like stuff oh. maybe about three films one of them and I think anti clock was like about a sort of proto Big Brother reality show where people just like stuck in a house can see. Haven't seen that one. But I've seen Separation and other sort of. I need to. I need to. Okay, so this is yeah. A these these are exciting films. They're like us. bad, but they're like excitingly flawed. It's like it's like, like Luke, hard to watch. It's like Luke, like Luke Mollet in, in the French context. Sometimes I've seen it. Oh, Luke Mollet is great because it's like you sometimes you have I to have like a. Episode. Yeah, like sometimes you have to have like a chaotic, 
uh, amateurish mm. B movie side of a film culture that kind of actually kind of uh, nourishes the mainstream. Nourishes the mainstream. Which mainstream. Didn't yeah. happen in Britain. The brain. No, it, they, this, these films didn't make it out the hood. But what we do have is during the same period as we're kind of shifting from this long sixties. You know, everyone's waking from the Hangover, the Summer of Love, and we move into the seventies and eighties. Mm-hmm. Is you begin to get a couple of strands that happen. Uh, we'll talk about a really important one, but very under under loved one of them in a minute, which is the London Film Makers Cooperative. Mm-hmm. But we will talk about folk horror, everyone's favourite. You know, we get the, emer- the the emergence of the folk horror, but then we get the kind of like play for today, Alan Clark yeah. um, film, which a lot of them are television films. They're yeah. films for television. Uh, co- you know, broadcast on Channel Four or broadcast on BBC. Uh, a lot of them, uh, and you get these two strands. You know, obviously, folk horror is like Ealing comedies or hammer horror mm-hmm. you know it's it's one of these kind of like cottage industries but f- i think weirdly like folk horror is one of the things people think about when they think about british film penders fen yeah yeah and um, it's one of the aspects of british film that is man. most obsessively revived yeah in britain because it's our biggest success in some ways like achievable success like yeah. you know lawrence of arabia isn't an achievable success but you know to make something is yeah to on a go low to budget. a cottage and yeah. make a film where like some weird some stones move around a bit yeah is like is like you can do that <laughs> that's such you, a damning but you if you what? inherit if you inherit yeah. thirty grand from your grandparents mm. you can go to fucking Wales and shoot a film where some stones well this was this film um move uh, around Brit, uh, London Film Festival uh, last year it was like a Brit- oh. no it wasn't that it was one called and it's meant no that was no, the it was called before. like the poison tree or something oh, I didn't see and that and it was like some sort of like folk horror thing and I saw it and it's obviously set in the 70s it's shot in like it's not shot oh, in okay. like film it's shot in digital and I knew it immediately I watched the trailer and I was like oh it's just the classic thing of like scrambling around as a, a British filmmaker now and you're like oh what are we going to do we're not making a film about identity so we'll make one like oh what if a tree was weird yeah, exactly. Oh, if you're okay. white, you yeah. have to like. If you're not white, you have to make a film about not being white. If, and you if you're say, white, you have to make a film. If you about say you're white, horror, they give you twenty-two <laughs> thousand pounds to make a film about <laughs> some stones moving around. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you know. Yeah. Anyway, we're getting ahead of films. No, we're um, getting ahead of ourselves. But you yeah, can't so just you make films about people being in a relationship and having a tumultuous time, or like no, or you know, the essence of being. You or, can't make a film know. about nothing. Like no. So Illegal. what you've got is yeah folk horror, which is very much a cottage industry, but then you know and really influential maybe in a cult circuit, yeah. you know sort of like the pinku in Japan or whatever. Um, but then you've got this kind of Alan Clarkey play for today's and so on. We'll talk about those in a second, but we'll talk about the other kind of like silo, which is the London yeah. Filmmakers Court. Yeah, and I think it's really important to talk about this 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 movement set up by Peter Goodall and, and Malcolm Legrice. Like Reese, I should say. Like yeah, yeah, Liz uh, Rhodes, and Liz John Rhodes. Smith. Yeah. Also, uh, Jacob Reese Mogg. Jack Smith. Auntie. John Smith was the labor leader who died at a very crucially important yeah. moment for Tony Blair's <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> career. Yeah, very crucially important <laughs> moment. Um, you've got uh, Jacob Reese Mogg's. Wait, no. John Smith. Jack Smith is another filmmaker. John Smith did jo- Gold John Smith Gun. is. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Sorry, he right. just has the same name as the labor leader. Yeah. Um, so you've got Jacob Reese Mogg's. Auntie, Don't which have a I always find name, though. no, because I find it very funny with the Jacob Rees Mogg thing. Because oh, Jacob, Rees- yeah, 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 this is a good bit of trivia. This yeah, is exactly so the sort of thing people tune into. Yeah, so J- Jacob Rees Mogg's uh, auntie uh, was a a member, a quite active member of London Filmmakers Co-op, and Jacob Rees Mogg and his brother appear in one of these like nice. early um, sort of experimental films that we catalogue as being you know an important part of British kind of like underground or independent cinema mm. and it's very funny to think it's almost like Mitch McConnell being in like a Stan Brackage film <laughs> you know in America it's like or like Nancy Pelosi being in a yeah, sort of like yeah, yeah. Mikas you know picnic or something it's a yeah. very strange part of like British culture um, but there's so London Filmmakers Co-op is set up in the 60s very funny that if you if you there's a book called Shoot 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 which is an archival history. It's very good of uh, London filmmakers co-op, and they go through some documents and stuff. And there's actually a telegram, and they question whether the telegram was ever sent or whether mm-hmm. it was sort of performatively like written out. Uh, and this telegram was sent to New York, uh, you know, filmmaker uh, f- anthology film archives in America in New York in the sixties, going like pretty much like basically oh, hi, we're doing our own thing, stop. Mm. Um, we're doing the thing that you guys are doing over there, stop. Uh, cool, good luck. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. And you get a lot of films that are like, uh, you know, when you think of the avant-garde film in uh, context, post-war avant-garde film, you know, we tend to think of these American figures like Mikas, we think of Michael Snow, we think of Stan Brackett, we think of Hollis Frampton, we yeah. think of all these, all these figures, Kenneth Anger. 
But the British context is really, really, really interesting. They really excelled at this idea of expanded cinema, you know, what you can do in the screening context. Yeah. They uh, managed to, they began to kind of like question and unpick the illusion of cinema, of narrative mm. cinema. And um, in a way they're seen as part, you know, some historians would see them in the tradition of British visual art, which mm. isn't a tradition that we would necessarily lament <laughs> as being no. insufficient. I think British <laughs> art in the 20th century was... Yeah, I think we're fine. <laughs> ...was <laughs> significant. Um, um, but yeah, but they were wait, they were thinking about cinema a lot and they were working within with yeah. the same tools as filmmakers. Um, they were theoreticians, uh, you know, so there's a lot of writing. Um, yeah, shout out to a um, uh, f- friend of the show, Daniel Neofetti. Um He wrote a piece about Godal and Le Grais, um where he articulates this uh situation with i mean the the americans frampton Bra- brackage al and uh sydney obviously was writing about them mm. uh they had a kind of culture of, of of theorizing their work but they generally i think theorized their work in kind of formal terms mm. whereas Gidal and le grice i think Gidal specifically if i'm remembering correctly um they situate their structural filmmaking either like lack of plot, they're using this duration as as, as the well, as loops, the content. Yeah, yeah. As content yeah. Um they situated that as be uh, in quite a politically dogmatic way. They were like this is this is radical because it's disrupting. Well they cited Adorno. Yeah, you know, yeah, Brackage like, never cited Adorno. No, true. You know? I mean yeah, Brackage was a big dumb dumb. Brackage just cited himself like <laughs> yeah. having a fun time at He's home. a big beautiful dummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, there was like an intellect um, there was an intellectual uh edge to, to the um anthology crew, but Yeah, hundred um, percent. but it was a lot more like self serious. Mm. And I think this will tie into Peter w- uh, blah, 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 Peter Watkins. Mm. Who we and Peter Woolen actually. Peter Woolen and Peter Watkins. We haven't yeah, spoken Peters. about Watkins because we're gonna save him up for our like people we actually like section. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Peter Watkins had already started working in this at this point in the timeline. Very interesting filmmaker. Lots to say. Um, I love. I'm re- I feel I actually really regret not watching Watkins that recently. Oh, uh, in preparation for the episode. I've seen. We used to watch Culloden as a family. Really? When we're growing up. Oh, that's, that's explains so much. Such a weird thing to do. I had so the, we had the, really Magna Carta. We had it. Yeah, it's my Magna Carta. I had it, we had it on VHS. Mm. I think my parents had recorded it from Channel wow. 4 when it was screened on like Channel 4 or some shit. So it was Culloden and it was something else on the other side, which was the fuck, the film about um, Charge of Light Brigade by. It was like two. Oh, the British film about British Josh, film, like yeah. by Carol Rice. Carol Rice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was those two films. The Lindsay like, Anderson documentary. It was like, it was like it was my, in my, in my dad's sense, it's like kind of war tape. Mm. But he had Culloden and he had the Carol, yeah, <laughs> the Carol Rice film, which is a very weird choice. Um, Culloden's a masterpiece, but we'll talk yep. about that later. Yeah. Um, so, what we have, yeah, so what we have here is, and I, I kind of, just to tying it, tying it back into the, the weird dogmatism of the Lochi. Uh, and the and the Lindsay Anderson people who sort of really desperately wanted film to change the world, really desperately mm. wanted, and so they they thought they would do that through content. So they thought they would like represent all these poor people as being noble and wonderful, and represent life as being drab and shit. And you know, um, and they were on the left and whatever we were on the left too. But mm. they got it they got it wrong. None of these none of these films achieved their like simplistic aims of like eliminating poverty. You know, they just sort of reminded you know shone mm. a kind of dull mirror up against people's lives. And maybe yeah. that was like in some way cathartic, but they're not. They don't last as as artworks in the way that um, you know work in other countries at that time do. Well, but similarly, the yeah. London filmmakers co-op Brits, as a, as as uh, opposed to the Americans, had this same feeling that filmmaking, even though they were insistent that it would only be formal, because they didn't even want to involve themselves in like narrative devices, because they saw that as being like hyper full conscious, full conscious yeah, yeah. by using that, because they were trying to disentangle. The film. They were trying to show people what. Hollywood was doing. Yeah, yeah. They're going, Hollywood is deceiving you by giving you this th- false yeah, catharsis. Yeah. It's leading you emotionally, manipulating you from one scene to another. What we're going to do is we're going to show you. We're just going to have the camera like drift around in and out of focus, the room. Yeah. And you're going to watch great. that for 15 minutes. It's amazing. Minutes. And it's like, you know, yeah, they were films, really yeah. engaged with what film was. But the funny thing is, they didn't really have a British context to play off. They're having to no. play off American film. And, you know, they're having to go, this is what a Hollywood film is doing to you. They weren't really able to say this is what, you know, I suppose they could, They at the same time, London Filmmakers Club was going on. Uh, if you could go to your local Odeon, you would probably be able to see Lawrence of Arabia. 
So in a way, they probably are reacting to that stuff in a way, like, you know. Yeah, but which we are saying is sort of also just kind of a product of America. Yeah, exactly. So th- there was like a British film, as it were, that they were kind of able to play off. But yeah, they were exposing the instrument instrumentation of film and how it was working on you, which was different from, because in America, they were much more, they would, I don't know, there's a different relationship to the material they were playing with. But I think, and in France, you know, you had the ho- a lot of the early new wave anyway was a r- kind of, what's the right word? Almost like a, a puppeteering of Hollywood. Mm. You know, Godard loved Hollywood in a way because it was great material to make films that were Hollywoodish mm. and to use Hollywood devices and to r- derange them. You know, Weekend, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. you know, great film, which is, is exposes a lot about ideology in France and internationally, but but uses kind of certain narrative devices like the chase and the, the yeah yeah but it's explosion. so disjointed and strange yeah i mean the great the great you to make good art you have to be ambivalent and the amazing thing about godard Boy. is that he like both loved and hated hollywood like clearly he was like a total fanboy for all these like westerns yeah um and yet he didn't want to make something that had that texture he couldn't afford to make something with that texture but he wanted to make something like that sampled that mm. and then did something like like idiosyncratic and, and energetic in his own space and yeah. his own language but you don't really get that in the, in the, in the British book. film is high concept and tries to just emulate the American thing or tries to react against that by being like this is the real life not like your sh- the w- your crazy western yeah, this is like a film about films. a fishmonger and he punches yeah. his wife and yeah, everything yeah. goes to shit for him and it's like it's very Brexit Britain yeah, I mean, Brexit in a way was a result of um, mm. uh, John Harris's wet dream it was another false dichotomy yeah. between um, the you know, Europe copying and, uh, other, yeah. other countries or uh, being drab and shit. Well, you know, th- so talk about like <laughs> kind of. No, no, it's that. true. That's the, that's the Malbec talking. Yeah, um, but, but the, that's the influence of France. Um, but when you talk about <laughs> it's Argentinian Malbec, this is French Malbec. Is it? Oh yeah, Cahors. Cool. Okay. Yes, the only wa- the only area of France produces Mal- uh, Malbec is Cahors. Fair enough. You know, the black wine. That's um, correct. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so. With the London Filmmakers Co-op, you know, you've got... I think actually think Peter Goodall... And I went on a bit of a Peter Goodall binge, actually. Um, As you should. Over the last couple of days. And, you know, he produced really riveting, interesting films. Uh, I think you've got, like, double Very take. similar to your films. Yeah, he, I, he realized he's kind of now a major touchstone He's like a me. shadow influence on um, your work. Yeah, 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 which is a strange thing because I never really engaged with him that much. But there's a lot, uh, a lot to love there, which is, you know, a lot of it is about... Um, quite deranging or estranging stuff and because they were producing things quite cheaply they were having to shoot in their bedrooms you know the stuff they were shooting in a way was kitchen sink in so far as they were looking to the things immediately around them you know yeah, yeah. a room double take by peter Goodall is pretty much just him panning around his bedroom and interesting stuff happens in a way or like formal devices happen um but you know he's shooting life as it is around him yeah, yeah, yeah. his life happens to be as a kind of you know bourgeois or you know, sort of poor uh, you know not doing not doing particularly well but you know sort of like coded bourgeois uh, filmmaker living in London you know when you see Riddles of the Sphinx Mulvey and Woolen that's yeah. largely shot in domestic context it was pretty yeah. relatively quite cheap to produce what year was um, um, Riddles of the Sphinx 77 okay this yeah. could be a good transition to talk about like the Channel 4 era of British film yeah which is an interesting there's two things one. we should talk about actually we should talk about pl- maybe we should talk about playwrights first and then we'll talk about like the explosion of like uh, Channel 4-ish films. Yeah. So firstly, quickly on playwrights. <laughs> From like David Lee Noel Coward, as soon as talkies come in, basically. David Lee Noel Coward, the, you have these like collaborations between playwrights and filmmakers. And it's a weird British common sense thing. Instead of instead of British people seeing film as a me- as a new medium and thinking how can, like, like, not to denigrate the literary history of Poland, I'm sure there's loads there, but like Polish people, when they, st- when they discovered cinema, they were like, we have to do something new with this new medium, mm. and they and they generally like they they focus on spectacle and Im- and like a certain visual immediacy, and they build a language through a moving image. Mm. That's why like I feel like Polish films. I mean, most of my favorite Polish films are from like sixties, seventies, but like th- mm. that, like there there are certain the countries, early Skolomowski. Uh, yeah, there are certain countries that like un- in, in you can just tell it in in the in the bones of the films they understand how cinema works. And British film from very early on thinks, oh, this is a bit like theatre. 
uh this is a bit like books but it's like on <laughs> like on an image yeah uh we're just gonna like take all the all the great stuff we already have it, i mean it's not all shakespeare adaptations or dickens or whatever but it's sometimes that but it's also just like playwrights are of that time who are writing stuff and they they, they learn to direct through the theater or they learn to write through the theater and then they decide uh, this has happened even with woodfall which was mm. coming out of a, a very immediate documentary um moment in in british film then when they started making uh, fiction, they were just like, oh, let's get these playwrights, these up-and-coming playwrights to just film their plays, basically. Yeah, so, pretty so, and, much. And even, and even up to Alan Clark, who we're going to speak about in a slightly more generous fashion, mm. um, you know, there's still this TV play culture behind a medium that is... And it also means the kind of actors, actors they're working with as well. You know, it means that they are going to RADA and they're looking for the actors who are trained on the stage, and there's a kind of West West Endification of a lot of acting. You, you even see it, to be honest, in um, Don't Look, uh, sorry, Don't Look Back in Agar, which is that literally a play. Uh, this Sporting Life, for example, life. even in the hysterics of argument, mm. it still feels like you're watching a play, the way the acting is done. You know, there are certain innovations that were made in um, American cinema, John Cassavetes, where, you know, and, and later, you know, Altman and so on, which is yeah. an overlapping dialogue understands that the con the reality is that people might over, over talk each other mm. you are a listener of a podcast you'll know that too well um <laughs> or in maybe the context of eastern europe and soviet union where silence and not talking it mm. becomes a thing right you know drifting becomes a thing or nostalgia where some you know the greatest moments of tarkovsky no dialogue happens whatsoever yeah, yeah. so whereas in you you get the distinct feeling with some of the, like even successful films from britain that you're kind of watching a stage play yeah. because people are comporting themselves in a way yeah. and you often have you know middle class actors uh playing the role of working class people you know just the elocution the delivery the waiting for the person to s very angrily say their thing and then yeah, and you, you say you're you find it when you know. talk to actors now i mean they don't there isn't a clear distinction in a lot of the training for actors or there just isn't a distinction between film and theatre acting when they're so clearly very different practices. But do you, do you feel like there used to be a lot? Because I guess there wasn't a training I just don't think in Britain uh, that distinction has ever been made and I think actors mm. just flow very much between those worlds whenever they can, for whatever work they can get. Yeah. Whereas like I think in other countries, certainly in America, there's like, there were dramatic, there were, um, you know... Uh, Dramaturgs. There were, yeah, yeah, people who taught acting not dramaturgs, people who taught like acting yeah, teachers yeah. who were like interested in raising a generation of film mm. actors to act on film and, to, and you know, the method through Brando, you know. I suppose it was much easier for people to start with film. Yeah, or Meisner, right, yeah. he goes to make like, a lot of, like Hollywood, yeah, because it's fresh, like that's where that's where film is like invented for the first time with people who've never done anything else. You've got your Elizabeth Taylor exactly. and so you start really young and Elizabeth Taylor starts acting when she's like, what, like 13 or something? <laughs> like it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. They're not going, they're not treading the boards in the West End and doing Hamlet. Yeah. You know, they're going straight into the onto the soundstage to to make films. And so even Orson Welles, who dabbles in theatre loads, seems to just understand that when you do cinema, you should Orson do different Wells things. Orson Welles is such an out, such a weirdo, though, in, a, in some ways, because he was so drenched in theatre, yeah. but understood so much about film. <laughs> it's weird. It's like he managed to do both brilliantly, and it's he, I think he's very unique for that, um, as we've said many times in the times we talked about. Um, so, should we do? Can I ask a question? Actually, of course, yeah. yeah. Seeing as theatre has had such a outsized influence in film, which is what we're about to talk about, has anyone ever tried to adapt Sarah Kane? <laughs> Interesting. I mean, I, I would, I would maybe put forward the Jane Arden and and Jack Bond films as a really? sort of like, as a sort of uh, what I imagine a Sarah Kane play might look like mm. on screen. But yeah, you're right. I think some of the best. Um, I think some of the best 20th century theatre is uh, is like really hard to adapt because it, you know, like Beckett is, mm. is a famously hard, impossible to adapt on film because yeah. it relies on the, the empty, the sort of empty space of the mm. theatre. Well, you know, Malone dies as a monologue of a dead man. Yeah, exactly. You can't, that's not <laughs> really like, it looks really I mean, weird when you try and put that know. on film. Yeah. Um, Crap's last tape is what? Is that two men in barrels? No, that's... That's uh, just a tape, isn't it? The Capsize tape is just a man with a tape recorder. Uh, what's <laughs> the one with the two guys in the barrels? It's like, called The know. End, doesn't it? No, it's called... Fucking hell. I should know this. 
Um, anyway, I, but like you so that the you it's know got a title Br- like the Brit- British British theatre and called. British writing is mm-hmm. has always excelled at like pushing the envelope of modern modernism. You know, you even take someone like Elliot. You know, Elliot was an American writer, but you know he wrote End Game. It was called End, End Game. Game. Okay. okay, that wasn't completely wrong. Then. But you know, you think like Britain has, has had a huge outsized Let's influence. The battery in uh, modern modern modernist theatre, modernist literature. But we haven't ever had like a modernist sensibility in um, popular fiction filmmaking. We've had a modernist sensibility with like um, filmmaking, but we never really did like minim minimalist minimalism. I think. Maybe Peter Goodall is one of the few um, uh, exceptions to that because some of Peter or a lot of Peter Goodall's work um, is quite minimalist in a way that, you know, you could imagine being very popular in America, like kind of Fluxus style films, you know, his cloud film, which is just footage of clouds and so you can't see anything true but um, then they represent yeah they rep i mean that rep- they represent the art world partly and they also mm. represent a response to the american avant-garde i mean it's difficult with this we're making a claim we're making a very bold claim and then huge claims. it's um it can be dangerous to just present every exception as like, like in a okay, all as some kind of <laughs> all that we, have, yeah. we don't have we have too many exceptions it seems like we don't actually have an argument um we, have we definitely have an argument yeah. um but yeah, there are these exceptions which actually rela- would actually kind of prove that the thing we're really looking for still isn't really there. And I would just like just like to pull back, like you look at like the French New Wave gives birth to so much. I mean, you have Eric Roma just knocking out fantastic films decade mm. after decade after the after the, and know, never really changing his, his uh, formula. Yeah, and he just makes films about life. I mean, I think mm. it's really what the irony is: all these people trying to make films about the everyday. About all these British films trying to make ordinary films about real people and they never stop to just like look around them look at their own lives mm. I mean we don't have that we also don't have like a kind of organic mumblecore tradition of the, you know the New York tradition mm. it wasn't called mumblecore when you know Woody Allen was doing it but like or Girlfriends and Claudia Fahl you know a culture of people just looking around at their life when they're young and just like filming them and their friends hanging out a at sense the bar of to use the very um, popular term of immediacy, but the immediacy of using your own, reflecting your own kind of milieu exactly. in the films you're making. And I think that produces a much more authentic, actually authentic film. Whereas exactly. Lindsay, Anderson, Lin- Lindsay Anderson going to Bradford, being like, right, we need some working class stories. Uh, you know, here's. <laughs> he's quite posh, isn't he? Yeah, he's very posh. And he's like, well, what do working class people do? Well, they argue and they he's smash mirrors. He was born in Bangalore, actually. He was the son of, a, a, col- Raj, of a colonial. He's a uh, Raj family. boy. But you know what? Wh- what you have there is it's still this kind of paternalism, which is I'm going to go to Bradford and I'm going to show real life. But they don't know what real life. They're not really asking these people what's going on inside their heads. They're saying, mm-hmm. "Well, real life is um, you get knocking up some girl and arguing about it." And yeah. you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning, for example, is a good example of that. So they are implanting a kind of alien seed. It's not to say that those narratives don't happen, but there's a disconnect. They don't really get the places they're trying to make films about. Yeah. They're saying, this is what life is like for and working they refuse, class people. And it's like, is it? They deny the, the working yeah. class people that they're making films about the dignity of a, like a... You said interiority earlier. Mm. Um, I, I guess what it is, is like they deny the possibility because they deny themselves, because they're so... They, they starve their films of formal innovation and intrigue. They starve their characters of like imagination, mm. and then occasionally this. Then there's like a response to this, like with Lynn Ramsey with sort of magic realism, where occasionally like some kind of, you know, noble pleb will like have a dream of something magical happening briefly. You know, like yeah. it's it or like fish day, tank, day. fish tank, where she just like look, there's, she has this like strange connection with a horse briefly. You yeah. know, like there's this like reaction to that that's still like sc- scrappy this really recent film I didn't see it of course but like because you know, I've given up watching these films that are obviously <laughs> going to be terrible you can quote that and, and say it discredits my entire argument it but really I don't care matter. they they are they you know these these films <laughs> they're obviously bad the the the, the, uh, the director of um, Scrapper said oh well, we, we, we I didn't like all these drab realist films being made when I grew up in Britain so we decided to paint the council estate rainbow colours in order to you know oh. I mean this is just a uh, you're just missing it. mentally ill. But that's it. I think the, the key thing is that interiority. And it's basically someone like Lindsay Anderson or Cara Rice never really stopping to ask what is actually going on in the heads of people that yeah, they're reporting to represent. Or not even asking themselves what's going on in their head. Maybe Lindsay Anderson would have made a much more interesting film. And he said, what do I think about the world immediately around Yeah. Me? You know, and, and, how and, do and, I see the world? And using the cinema 
and actually that's why Don't Look Now is really good because it just has really good mise en scene. But Incredible, like yeah. using the cinema, using the tools of cinema to to be expressive, mm. rather than to do. I mean, what's what's so obvious about Saturday Night and Sunday Morning? It starts with this guy like at the factory. Uh, you know, some sort of upward shots of him, like, and he's like, you know, whatever people say, I'm, that's what I'm not. I'm fucking, you know, I'm fucking tough. You know, like, you like, hear him like being a like, north, it's yeah. authentic salt of the earth northern guy, you know, and but that's, that's interiority. Exactly, though, that's, that's the not. that's what stands in for interiority. And you can sort of intellectually say, yes, it's inter- interiority, but it's not what cinema ineffably, unlike any other medium, does, which is like well, show. It's, it's a deference to the monologue, which is a theatrical exactly, device. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. saying, oh, we've got this scene, but how can you tell that through? You know, a great, a g- a, you know, a great example of that is the ennui felt by Belmondo in uh, Bouts de Soufflé, right? Yeah, which is shown in his body, and it's shown in how he moves through spaces. It's his looseness. Mm. It's his the dissolute look in his face it's it's the rapid cutting of his you know eyes as they yeah. look around and it's, sh- and it's shown innovation. in the f- and yeah. it's shown in the fact that he ends the film in a you know in a shootout, a shootout. in a western style shootout yeah. you know God which is unaf- the hollywood device exactly god is unafraid of using the hollywood devices to mm. express the inner world of the characters um yeah because he knows that's how to make good cinema and unfortunately that's beyond the capability of <laughs> any british <laughs> filmmaker seemingly but i remember in my british film article which i i never finished I I talked about Pedro Costa, yeah. the Portuguese director, and I think he talking about interiority expressed through cinematic devices. He works almost like Lindsay Anderson with like quite poor people who are not not of. Well, he uses uh, non actors. Yeah, non actors. Yeah, he he works uses actual Cape Verdean migrants uh, exactly. in most of his films. So like in Vander's Room, uh, Horse Money, all these films. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about what Pedro Costa does is he really commits to the bit. Exactly. He also estranges their lives. Yeah. You know, he shoots, uh, I think, whole, is it whole? I think a lot of his films are shot in digital later. So he shoots them in this very kind of oily digital. Um, he shoots in... They're very stark. Very stark. They're very, very composed. Hollywood, yeah. It's very stiff in a way. His favorite filmmakers um, are like John Ford and Lubitsch and stuff like He loves really Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he's a lot of it is he doesn't declare or and isn't dogmatic, so we don't get exposition about why the Cape Verdean's life is X. You know, he yeah, doesn't yeah, tell yeah, us yeah. that. We just see this slightly ghost-like. It's like limbo or the afterlife. We see these characters kind of, you know, drifting through these strange encounters, and it's very slow and glacial. And Pedro Costa really captures, you know, because he's really committed to it. He's mm. made what six features in Fontaine House over the years, yeah. you know, and he's followed this, he's worked with the same actors as they've lived and died. Mm. Um, the whole neighborhood itself has kind of like gone from shantytown to kind of like new development and so on. He's captured that entire process. Um, and so I think there it wasn't just a lazy, right, let's go to Margate and film some, <laughs> some brats at an arcade. It's like really going, yeah, okay, yeah. what is life actually l- what is going on in this guy's what's going on in Vander's head actually you know he uses certain devices like a a letter that is sent from a lover I know we're down doing a Portugal chat but oh my god you know a letter <laughs> that is sent from classic you're trying to about British yeah. cinema and you, you just get so Portugal. bored you're not talking about <laughs> Portuguese <laughs> cinema but it reminds me of how good Pesha Costa is and yeah. you know, he ends up using this letter which is sent from a love letter it's sent from Cape Verde to uh, Vander in, um, in, in, in in Portugal in Lisbon um, and that that document is incredibly beautiful how he you know sometimes pulls out this letter and reads it mm. and then that same letter reappears later in dialogue in one of the later films in horse money i think that mm. letter then reappears yeah, it it's starts a, it's off a whole in, um, network the first film is yeah it's in colossal youth mm. it starts off in uh, it's in, in horse money it starts off in what's that really good one in, that's actually set in cape verde Oh, the uh, House of Lava? Yeah, House of Lava. Yeah, House of Lava, yeah. Um, but yeah, but he doesn't, what's important is he doesn't deny himself the great pleasure of... Being an artist. Of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he doesn't think, oh, these are poor people who I don't understand, so therefore I must like just employ the most pedestrian means to tell their story. He thinks, mm. okay, I have respect for these people. I want to dignify their lives. I also want to like enjoy myself and actually like mm. create something that is, is, a fe- is a feeling rather than like yeah. a representation um and i you know he loves cinema and he just you know it, it's that it's that simple i feel like you know mm. if, if if british filmmakers did, you know did stop denying themselves the pleasure of cinema they might actually that's a very it's a very protestant it's a very english thing to be like you know we can't good possibly films. enjoy ourselves yeah yeah we can't possibly enjoy ourselves it's missionary only with the lights off 
in the <laughs> British context, you know, isn't it? It's like, I guess we have to have a camera here recording yeah. this. Fine, you know, it's like, it's like almost as if Lindsay Anderson would produce, if he'd made, if he was a cam girl, mm. his film would be of the si- similar artistic merit, you know, if he was just recording <laughs> himself going, oh, well, it's tough being working class, by the way. I'm, Speaking you know, of, and on that, and on that, um, can we talk about Channel on, 4? On now? that note, yes. So we're getting into the 70s to the Play 80s. For today we have to sort about. of like move back and forth because we Play, Play Today started in the 60s. Uh, Peter Watkins started in the 60s mm. doing... Um, let's talk about Watkins, actually, because what Watkins works for the BBC in the 60s. He makes this amazing film, Culloden, which is a uh, a kind of... A, it, it somehow manages to combine docu and drama. It's a neorealist. Actually, no, what he's doing is he's taking the the uh, uh, Flaherty, Robert Flaherty uh, kind of logic to its extreme conclusion. And Robert Flaherty always said that reality isn't enough. You know, mm-hmm. so famously when he did Nanook of the North, it was all staged. You know, so his oh, re- really? yeah, yeah, so his realistic portrayal of you know, Nanook was really a inuit. Nan fluke of the North. Nan fluke, <laughs> yes. Uh Nanook Deep fake of the North. Deep <laughs> fake of the North. Um <laughs> so Nanook was like a real Inuit Eskimo, but he staged the scenes and the encounters and the moments of drama were staged. So mm-hmm. you know, because he said, Well, reality isn't real enough. He said it's not real yeah, enough, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's boring. So um a Moana, respectable artistic statement yeah he made it artistic li- he introduced a kind of artistic license into what he was doing mm-hmm. uh, and I feel like Peter Watkins kind of takes that tradition of British, British social realist documentary making and says well reality isn't enough you know I can't just show the battle of Culloden to tell mm-hmm. the story of Culloden so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make apparent the staginess of it and one of the things he does is like he introduces the element of newsreel he interviews the soldiers as they're waiting to die. Yeah, he does like a, a battle, which weirdly is a very British thing to do a battle reenactment. <laughs> he does a battle <laughs> yeah. reenactment of a 1745 yes. yeah. battle between English uh, and royalist, Charlie, English between royalists the Catholics and, and the Prots. Yeah. Exactly, English royalists and, and Catholic Scots. Um, and it's a very brutal and co- and very colonially uh, colonial uh, war, basically. And it reveals... In, it's shot like a football match. Yeah, it's shot like a football match. It reveals in very stark, uh, quite coldly delivered. Um, I mean, it's good in the same way that like Brass Eye is good. Actually, when I mean, we were invoking oh God, TV it's here, quite Brass Eye. In a but way. it is. But yeah. it, it it uses it uses the cold um, and the stern face of the of the British authoritarian patrician, the the British the British face that that people uh, that people saw. Mm. In, in the colonies when the ships first arrived. You know, it's it's using the, the, the tone. Um, the BBC tone. Yeah, really. the BBC yeah. tone uh, knowingly and presenting presenting the information. It's kind of claustrophobic the way that it like presents this. We get these kind of like, you know, not, not, not close-ups, they're medium shots, head and shoulders. And yeah, so yeah. we'll get the camera suddenly. So we're getting a bit of the play of the battle and then we'll get like a head and shoulders of the, maybe the Scottish soldier or we'll get a picture of the English conscripts, not conscript at that time, they were volunteer army, but, you know, um, whatever. And they'll talk and they'll go, oh, yeah, I'm actually really scared about, you know, dying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And oh, I don't really know what's going on. And it's presented as a kind of like a vox pop. Yeah. Really, which is very modern. It's like incredibly yeah, yeah. modern within the instruments that were available to Watkins, you know, looking at the BBC because the, the, the vox pop was like an emergent thing in the news, wasn't it? It was yeah, quite yeah. radical in the way to go. It's not just the newsreader telling you what's happening. We're going to go into the street and say, grab some hapless passerby and go, what do you think about the gold standard? And yeah, go, oh, it's well. it's a really interesting way of making, of telling a story. And, and mm. unlike, um, uh, yeah, unlike Lindsay Anderson, uh, as he switches from, um, I mean, he, he then makes this film If, which kind of just so happens to be good because it's about like people blowing up a school. It's which cathartic. Is, which is obviously cathartic. Yeah, but again, it's cathartic. sort of, it, it, I think it's, it's really he, theatrical. He finally though. like embraces yeah. his like his like angry posh man mode, uh, but it's still got nothing on Zero de Conduit. And then he makes these films. I haven't John seen Bigger them, but I saw the clips of the Malcolm Dow films mm-hmm. afterwards, and they seem really dogmatic and, and a bit mm-hmm. awkward. Um, but yeah, uh, Culloden is like a masterful like postmodern, hmm. um, yeah. like fu- like formally innovative. De, like reconciliation with a historical moment it's very cinematic it's very exciting to watch um it's it's using mediation very skillfully which is something mm. peter watkins goes on to do 
Peter Watkins develops a sort of like slightly like he has a sort of he's so obsessed with like the way the media works and the mm. way things are constructed that I think like towards the end of his career he like and he's so an, he's so uh, vehemently anti-imperialist which of course we massively support here but free Palestine but I think he kind of um, uh, he's like gets a bit almost too paranoid or too dogmatic about the about the sort of manufacturing consent like element of his gets a little bit higher on his own supply yeah well he way, doesn't yeah. adapt at least to the yeah. way that the that, that propaganda changes in his lifetime mm. um, anyway whatever like he's already made like some great films like Edward Monk amazing it, you know he's, yeah he, the Monk film is good he's, he's kind of in the commune thing he's, like, he's done lots of very interesting things with cinema and it's unusual to have someone like that in in um in British film. Mm, yeah. On that note, let, let's. Um, I want to make myself a glass of water and change the battery. Mm. So we will just have, we'll entertain a small intermission during which we will play uh, for you in the <laughs> podcast a clip of Lindsay Anderson uh, 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 responding to criticisms of kitchen sink cinema. Yes. Enjoy. Middle class critics, and of course all critics are middle class by definition, didn't really like these films. Kitchen sink was the standard dismissive epithet, with the implication that they all looked the same, like wogs or Chinamen. Listeners, you will have just enjoyed the great pleasure of that hilarious clip of Lindsay Anderson. Uh, I think displaying a kind of... Um, obviously, he doesn't use those terms um, uh, with, with you know, uh, bigoted passion, but... Uh, Kind of sh- showing his ass a bit, showing his uh, his own the the reasoning and the sort of superiority behind his mm. his uh, engagement with the arts. His war his war with the kind of middle class critic or the bourgeois critic, I think, is is, is also his idea, which is quite Hila- yeah quite hilarious that critics will middle because they will have salaries right, whereas now yeah. the critic is the, sort of the proca- precariat exactly and can't say what he thinks. No danger of that here, <laughs> because <laughs> we both make radio. our money doing other things, and <laughs> therefore can fuck. only release an episode every six weeks. Um, so yeah, exactly. So um, what what we will say is, so at certain points there have been certain prognoses of British film. Yes, um, Peter Woolen wrote a quite insightful or incisive article about British film, or the you know trying to kind of map out the contours of the British New Wave, and he's very like bullish. He's bullish for the British New Wave in some ways. He's like he he sees this kind of article is really good. It's in NLR. It was republished in the NLR. It was lost, but it was been translated. It's Italian, so the version on the LNR is a retranslation back from Italian. It's from nineteen sixty three. Yeah, so he's he's this sporting life has just come out. A few of the early lows have just come out, and he, yeah, he's he's so think, he's looking with intrigue at the British New Wave, and yeah. he's saying, okay, this could be the start of something interesting. Yeah, but or not. he's unsure. So he says, you know, British cinema has remained more subordinate to American than the other. In France, Italy, and Japan, the linguistic difference and in general, the lesser extent of American cultural and economic penetration allowed the development of a more autonomous cinema. But he's saying, you know, he's kind of mapping out things we know. Um, there's a great bit where he, there's a great bit where he says that the innovation in the British New Wave and in free cinema was primarily an innovation in content. Content, in subject yeah. matter, not in, in form. Yeah, but he even points out here, he says, while the new French directors wrote their own scripts or at least worked from material written specifically for the cinema, the British relied on adaptations mm. from a narrow and fairly homogenous set of writers. So he's kind of pointing out, you know, the, uh, I suppose, the unique, can, some of the things we've already said about the kind of the, the British reliance on theatre and on, on adaptations yeah, as yeah. well, textual adaptations. And then they get so excited that they're like working with like Sheila Delaney. And Alan Silliter. They're like, look <laughs> at these. They're like, we we fucking we fucking wrote a fucking script with Sheila Delaney and Alan Silliter. It's like, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's that doesn't you just you, they're, they're fine, but they're not like you know. No. They make a I'm good just, a good Smiths cover. So going 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 over it now. Um, what else does he say? Yeah, he's just he's ambiguous at the end. He's just like, oh, maybe there's some interesting stuff happening. Maybe we're on the edge of a new wave. Obviously, I can see how it might have felt like that. I mean, what does he say? Fifty three. He wrote no sixty three. Sixty three. Right right yeah. The thing is, one of one of my one of my favorite texts is you know uh, we we spoke very briefly earlier. We're, we're going to now roll back in time really quickly to 1927 when Close Up Film Magazine is started, oh, okay. which gave its name to obviously Close Up Cinema that some of you may go to. Um, is that where it got its name from? It must do. Well, Close Up is just kind of... A close yeah, I think up. it got its name from the Kiarostami film. Though. I thought it got its name from I mean, it's British just a, film it's a generic film it's technique. It's very, it's like, yeah, long shot. 
Yeah. Um, I'd rather, I think you'd call your cinema a long shot. But no, it's a bit of a long <laughs> shot, mate. Yeah, a bit of a long shot. <laughs> We're um, going to go and see Tarkovsky again. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a long shot. Um, but so there's a group called the Pool Group, who are a group, uh, production company who was set up. They're actually based in Switzerland, but there's two Brits in there. Um, and Close Up Magazine is their kind of mouthpiece or their organ. Mm. Uh, and they bring lots of writers and directors and whoever just interested in the kind of nascent film industry uh, in mm -hmm. Britain. And they actually for many years published a lot of really incisive articles about British film mm -hmm. or global cinema. Yeah. Um, so like, so Kenneth McPherson, who we'll talk about in a bit, I think in a bit more depth, mm. you know, he, there's a, an amazing sort of the first issue of close up, which was published in 1927. Uh, he kind of does a bit of an autopsy on British film as he sees oh, it, right. British conduct. And it's, it's an article called as is. Um, and it's really funny when you think about, He's talking about the the you know the now, and he so he sort of says, fifty odd, odd years hasn't done so badly in getting an art into the world that fifty more will be turned into the art. <laughs> but now, after some somewhat magnificent growth, one feels one feels here is its critical stage. So he's beginning to talk about uh, you know the kind of where are we at in film? It's nineteen twenty seven. You know, right? Okay, so know, quite early, really, really early. But what he does is he ends up talking about. Uh, England, you know, the, right. the the culture of England, and he's really doomy about England. So he says that basically that England is ruled by bureaucrats, um, is penny pinching, yeah. lacks imagination, yeah. has yeah. a fear of the intelligentsia yeah. or anything that smacks of yeah. smartness or being smart, you know. And he, so I'll just I'll pull a paragraph. Uh, All these things remain true today. I'll pull out a paragraph, kind of at random. Uh, nonetheless. England is going ahead on this revival. He means a film revival. And its sole purpose is the revival of the film industry and not film art. It's no sin at all because really good art is commercial, he says, which I disagree with uh, in some senses. But he's basically saying that one thing the UK or England specialized in was specialists, bureaucrats, administrators, yada, yada, yada. This is him talking 1927. Okay. But he's really, really, really gloomy about the kind of prospects for, for English film to really generate something kind of exciting. He wants to be entertained. Yeah. Right. And there's another well, spectacle. Yeah, spectacle. And what I'll do is I'll, we can leave a link in the show notes, as people say. But there's, there's two articles. There's his, and there's one by Oswald Blakeston, who's a writer and sometimes filmmaker, uh, called British Solicisms which is actually better, I think, about kind of like, it's it's funny because you look at it in the context of Peter Woolen and you look at it in the context of what we're saying now, but it starts like this. Everyone is talking of a revival of British films. The phrase is hardly felicitous. Where in the history of British pictures are to be found films with the aesthetic merits of Caligar Caligari, warning shadows or the last laugh? Rather should we speak of the birth of British films, but that would be too obviously a confession of weakness. If there is a genius in a country, it is bound to come out to make itself felt in some way or another. Remember that England was supplying films to America before the war and then realized what a stigma it would be for us after all these years to speak of the birth of British films. So we point at dreadful scarecrows of the past and gibber of the revival of British films. And it's a very interesting article because he kind of, I suppose, it's him griping really, but he gained points up some things that uh, McPherson also talked about, which I suppose were just like, he's basically saying, it's very infertile soil in the UK. Mm. Some of his points are a bit specious. He's like, well, maybe it's the climate. Or maybe it's like, you know, it rains a lot here. So maybe that's, you know, why we can't really... As we were discussing with my flatmate earlier, yeah, it also yeah. rains a lot in Hungary. And they yeah. managed to produce Mick Lushank show, mm. Pelletar, and uh, many other... Yeah. 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 Mr. Jarosz. Jarosz, yeah, many, But I think so that it's just interesting to go back to the very literally... Er not even early in 1927, but, you know early-ish days of film and even then there were people going fuck japan britain japan germany france italy they're making films russia they're making films america they're making films yeah. they're like pulling the hair out and going why aren't british films taking off they're going british cinema is a technical apparatus yeah. and it's true like even now like all the time i go to a party or go anywhere and you'll meet someone who's like a cinematographer you'll meet someone who's like a sound mixer you meet loads of people who work in film. Yeah, yeah. But are they working on British production? No. Yeah. Well, we we provide we 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 open our legs somewhat to the to America again because we we show all of their crappy films. A lot of their uh, their crappy films are based on British IP, like fucking Harry Potter, Harry Potter, and all the peer dramas and and um, uh, Shakespeare stuff and um, mm. 
James Bond, whatever. Um, and and a lot of actors are in it, and obviously a lot of directors. We talked about you know Charlie Chaplin, Alfred Hitchcock, Jonathan Glazer, Nicholas Rogue, Ridley Scott, whatever mm. directors Chris Nolan have gone over there. Some of them we like, some of them we don't. Um, there a lot of films get made here for tax reasons. Mm. Um, yes, British cinema is just. It, it doesn't allow itself to flourish. There doesn't seem to be a lever in the system that would want it to flourish. Mm. Um, shall we talk about TV-ish? Let's talk about TV. The, the TV we've, we've move. Been, we've been edging around. We this have, for and we a started while. off talking about Woolen. And he is a television. He's a he's a he's a media literate director. Mm. Um, but going through the seventies, you have Play for Today, which one ta- one really important talent that Play for Today really foregrounds. Uh, is Alan Clark, big time, who is a, a, a genuinely influential figure? I mean, he influences Harmony Korine, um really heavily, for instance. Um, you know, genuinely cinematic influence. Even though he's working with plays, he, he discovers a way um, in Elephant and Christine. He discovers a way to to not presume an interiority to characters, but to allow a bit of sort of Bressonian space around their actions. Mm. Um, Road. Road, which is a very odd film, one of my favourite films. Really uh, it is based on a play, but it's just du- it's so like absurdist and strange. And he has these always w- with those other two films that I mentioned, um, and with Made in Britain, which is a bit more like social social realist. Oh. Um, but he uses yeah these amazing tracking shots that have this real belligerence to them. You know they are like you know well, like, like elephant bel- elephant from nineteen eighty nine is all tracking shots. Yes, tracking exactly. Shots yeah, yeah. it's much, a structural you know. film basically. It's yeah. a narrative structural film. So those toast Christine actually. Christine's a really mm. good example of of um yeah of a film that sort of uses uh uses restraint and minimalism really well to tell a it story. It doesn't over. It doesn't do over exposition. Exactly. Anyway. It's it's not, it, yeah. So it, even I mean, Elephant, one of its big even though it's favorite. about an issue, even though it's an issues film, mm. it doesn't actually it's address the issue ever. It specifically avoids the issue. I know I say issues. We just say at the beginning. Do you know what anything is? It does. It has the quote at the beginning going, "The troubles were the elephant in the room." Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but aside if you can, from if, you can that, if you can ignore that, yeah. Director's cut should just cut the entire yeah, at the yeah. beginning. And is just, that why it's called Elephant? Yeah. Funny. But, you it's know, nice when a film has a title that, like Margaret, you know, like mm. when a film has a title that isn't re- is only really briefly appears or is important. Yeah, but um, at the same time, so you've got Alan Clark, and Alan Clark also works in the, f- the folk horror genre. He shoots um, Pender's Femme. Yeah, and he's just very good. You know, he's he's a jobbing filmmaker. Um, in a way, he's kind of like a weird antecedent of someone like Joanna Hogg because Joanna Hogg came up through. To EastEnders, yeah. EastEnders and stuff. I mean, that, 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 that feels like more of a... Not that that's like artistic. In yeah, way, that feels like yeah. more of like, a, not a coincidence, but just like a career path. But yeah, yeah you have like film for, ch- channel for like Germany. Fil- I mean, we don't really like German. We yeah, think he's a German. bit twee. Um, and quite theatrical and like sort of kind of an art world director in some ways. I'm just, uh, with German, I'm like, fine yeah right. we have so we have also like we have the play for today like gives the birth of like also mike lee who again we don't find that interesting although we do like naked, naked. Is good, yeah. um sorry i'm speaking for us <laughs> yeah. like we speak as one we agree we don't always agree, we on, these agree things. on most things but, but yeah we on this on this we've talked about this a lot so we do tend to agree um or we know what we agree on um yeah. And then, of course, yeah, you have Peter Greenaway, you have Sally Potter. Now, should we talk just as a little straw example about The Gold Diggers by Sally Potter, which was can her we, debut Can we film. mention one more name? Of course. Peter Brook. Peter Brook, A very yes. important name, which actually, in, in that kind of 60s, 70s, 80s expanse, yeah. I think it's really, like, really a kind of two-man game between Alan Clark and Peter Brook. Right, okay. And you've got supporting characters who are doing their kind of own, their own thing, and you've got Watkins who's kind of doing his own thing. Yeah, and then you've got Greenway on the on the on the flank, and Greenway is kind of like your your left winger or your right winger in a way. Like he's yeah. kind of this autonomous thing that's you still know, hasn't killed himself. Still hasn't killed himself. Sorry, he said he killed himself at eighties now at eighty two. <laughs> yeah, he um, just he just he chickened out. He has like a teenage daughter, so yeah, I understand. But we will let him off the hook, uh, even though when he won't put himself on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's talk about Sally Potter because Sally Potter is an interesting one because I think Sally Potter is one of the most interesting. She's almost like a palimpsest of all British filmmaking from the 20th century. She's like actually the This is an interesting take. Okay, so because what she does is she starts off with a vigorous, experimental, surreal, almost Dadaist film called Gold Diggers. Mm. And she ends up eventually 
becoming Richard Curtis. Yeah. So there's a way in which she kind of like picks up all, and she actually hasn't made that many films. I think if you look at her filmography, she's kind of done the Fellini eight and a half. She might have done less than that. Yeah. You know, she, I mean, she. I imagine it's quite hard to get the sort of things she makes funded. Yeah, even she's now been, she's been making films for so long. You yeah, know? yeah, like, and I think it's so she's made. Uh, she's gone through all these kind of like rhythms, but I think let's talk about Gold Diggers because I think Gold Diggers is one of these. Nobody knows about Gold Diggers. No, it's an extraordinary film. It has its weaknesses. All films have their weaknesses. Um, no, I mean it does have its weaknesses, but it's yeah. not. It's not like the trial or something. It's not like no. a really stone cold banger. Yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> um, so, so tell tell our audience about Gold uh, about Gold Diggers because they almost certainly haven't seen it. Um, yeah, I, I mean think. we were told uh, about Gold Diggers by a friend of the pod, Nikolaus Paneski. Uh, it's a f- it's mm. the f- debut film by Sally Potter. It is. Yeah. It has seen year nineteen eighty three. I think. Yeah. Um, it is a film about work and about value, the value form. Uh, it has these scenes of the gold, you know, the, the gold rush gold diggers, uh, you know, um, mm. from America in America and Canada. Where was it? Where did the gold rush happen? Klondike. Klondike, right. Okay. And also, part, it was the whole West Coast, really, right. from Canada down okay, to yeah, yeah. California, parts of California, mostly Klondike. Which and is it Canada. has these kind of genre set scenes. Mm. They're a bit like Chaplin's film, The Gold Rush, shot in black and white. It's all shot in black and white. You have these like scenes, greed as well. Actually. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of greed. Uh, you, you have these scenes shot in bank, in actual bank, in central London, the Bank of England. Mm. Um, these procession scenes. You have these scenes that are a bit like the reason I said trial is because there are some scenes that look a lot like the trial. There's some scenes about quite Kafkaesque scenes about mm. a woman never getting bureaucracy, never getting a, a miserable work life. It's with a the big oversized yeah, yeah, like yeah. Uh, bank desk with a man. Exactly, uh, yeah. Declaring it's everything. like a film that enjoys its own playful dogmatism. Mm. It's a film, it's like a like kind of a Marxist film. It has like music at the beginning and end. Um, it's, uh, it has like these this ballroom bit. Like I'm remembering fragments of it. It does have a story, a through line, <laughs> but it is kind of also a collage of these different cinematic spaces. So it's quite poetic. It's a bit like a dream. Um, it, yeah, it's an extremely bold work where someone was clearly trusted mm. with a lot of money to do something interesting very early on in their yeah. career, uh, which is something that did happen fairly often in Britain in the 80s, despite whatever Thatcherism or whatever, uh, or maybe in response to it in some ways. But it wasn't like now where like there's an absolute pittance going around in the British film industry and the only films that get funded are just like miserable social realist films. Mm. Um, or identitarian films. Yeah, exactly. Or, Which yeah, are in their own way miserable, miserable social yeah, realist. You're kind of, your are yeah. you know. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's not miserable. That's just like... No, no, it's 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 falsely it's Cartesian. It's a, a cur- it's a Cartesian, yeah. <laughs> Cartesian. <laughs> a, Cur- a Richard Cartesian experience. Yeah. Um, again, haven't seen Riley, and it's obviously just complete complete nonsense. Have you not? Yeah. No, have you? No, of course not. As such, friends of ours have I'm seen shocked. it, but you just yeah. you don't like. I am, you know, I'm not. I could go- just go to Riley. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going to watch a, a film that has a trailer like that. I mean, it's just, <laughs> and the directors are clearly morons. I mean, it is. Mm. It's it's a it's a very um Well it has the logic of, of Lindsay Anderson in a way about it, which is like Well does Riley. Yeah, it's like if we show just life, then it's like then it become be a documentary filmmaker. Yeah, but it's not yeah, it's you're I, not you're I, invested in, in we 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 we're too, talking too much about a film we haven't seen now, but yeah, yeah, we have we feel like Ryan Lane is um, like a kind of it, it's a different identity doing the love actually thing. Anyway. Yeah. Um and, and therefore we're not interested in it. Um yeah. it, it so looking 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 back to the the, the, the golden era, mm. the gold diggers, the golden era of of a sort of art world infused narrative cinema filmmaking that was funded by TV companies mm. and by the arts, by the film institute, British Film Institute and by arts organizations. Um, a lot of that kind of weird and eerie British Britishness that's like British culture that's nostalgized by theorists now mm. is like formed in that era and under those circumstances. Yeah. I Even though we don't really like Jarman, but like Sally Potter's later work as well with Tilda Swinton. I mean, Tilda Swinton is all over this stuff. Even Joanna Ho- Joanna Hogg like starts working here and then like flounders and, well, and comes w- back. When you look at um, Joanna Hogg's Souvenir Part 2, 
I think it is quite indebted to Sally Potter's Gold Diggers. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah, and the dream sequence or the film. I think the film that the character makes in that film is Sally Potter's Gold Diggers. Yeah, um, pretty much. But so you get these kind of unusual experiments, which yeah, maybe a little bit Arts Council funded. Jarman again is one of them. Um, they are elephant feels like a kind of strange elephant in the room in a way. You know, it's like it does stand out. It's a structural film, like you said. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a film that lasts thirty eight minutes and features a series of decontextualized killings. They're just, yeah. you'll get a shot where a man is walking in a field or a park or down a street or in a warehouse and then just kills someone. Yeah. And then the, sh the next shot studies the body of the person he's just killed. Yeah. And then we jump to another killing. He's talking about the troubles, um, but it's very daring. And like, you know, there's no music, I think. I'm pretty sure it's just uh, yeah, there's diegetic, no music, yeah. just diegetic sound. Um, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting, daring moment. I can't really... It would be like somebody n making a film about the 7-7 bombings <laughs> and all we do is follow the bomber on the way, getting the bus, putting yeah. the bag on and then blowing themselves up in the film. And it's like... And it's Gus like Van Sant, talking about yeah. Alan Clark's influence. Yeah. He influences is Harmony Korean. Harmony Korean frequently expresses the debt he owes to Alan Clark. But Gus yeah. Van Sant literally just does a remake about Columbine. Yeah. Um, of, of elephant, yeah, a, a procedural, a processualist film uh, in a lot of ways. So there are these like weird experiments in the seventies and eighties, but like a lot of it is dominated by these kind of like play for today, and you get certain directors who have one foot in both camps. You know, one of the things about we mentioned Peter Brook. Peter Brook makes some really interesting films, um, but at the same time, he then makes a film like you know, so he makes Lord of the Flies, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, I love good film, film, good film. I love that film. Um, he makes Tell Me Lies, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of like almost Goddardian, Brechtian True. film about That's you exciting. Know, youth and politics and culture. And it's very interesting. It's very funny and it's got lots of musical interludes and it's great. Uh, but then he makes Marat Sade, which is just pretty much a play. stage, a play. Filmed quite competently, but it doesn't. Yeah do anything cinematic and he does really. that a couple of times and he, you know he's just like suddenly and it's a lot of the you know the thing is Peter Brook is Peter Brook I think in his career directed more stage plays than he directed films yeah he was from theatre it was never was gonna the it's lucky background. that it worked out with all of the size yeah. kind of but yeah it was never gonna be Peter Brook was never I mean I, I did get briefly excited we were gonna do an episode on Peter Brook I got briefly excited about him because <laughs> Well, it's because Lord of the Flies is very good. <laughs> and, and we you know, both saw Marat Sade and we were like, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck this. Because it's just a play. He d mm. he doesn't really... I mean, he's great. He's a he's a great formalist in theatre and he was obviously taught mm. by Krasovsky and, you know, whatever. Great, you know. He worked with non-actors as well. Uh, yeah. In, 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 in Marat Sade, you know, he had he had the, the, the potentials there. But again, yeah, he's not yeah. like... He's not our Pasolini, you know. It's just no. that the comparison is just is not there. So um, yeah, so there's this 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 period in the eighties where some interesting stuff is happening. Um, some people slip through the cracks, yeah. and then the thing is, we hit we hit the death knell, and we lurch into the nineties and then into two thousands. And what we don't get is well, what happens is film just tapers off those interesting occasional bubbles that rise to the surface. Um, you know, your Sally Potters and so on. They stop bubbling you know the body the corpses yeah body they, right they, there, they, they become know. they sort of like gentrify themselves and become more mainstream yeah because then sally potter makes a uh, ginger and rosa which yeah. is a proto this is in the noughties in the teens right teens. 2012 or something yeah i think ginger and rosa is two nine late 90s early 2000s but these no, the ginger and rosa is 2012 actually it's 2012 yeah. yeah yeah um but yeah so you have like the like i mean the best british film of the 90s is naked yeah I don't. I can't try. Uh, London. Oh, there's London by Patrick Keeler. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's definitely So, so then there's like this, <laughs> again. But London is like a channel. F is a film channel four BFI style film. Mm. I don't know which one it's funded by, but one of them, maybe both. Um, so London is is part of that weird, like ha haunt, like slightly hauntological. With psychogeography. Psych it? Yeah, it's kind of psychogeography. It's from that, that, that psychogeography. And, and so a when I when I did a, a shout out on social media the other day, somebody did ask. Uh, you know, somebody said, sorry, I'm forgetting who suggested this, um, but somebody one did. One of our many fans. One of our many fans. On Twitter. Did ask about Patrick Keeler, Andrew Cotting, Ben Rivers, and... Yeah, Rivers yeah, of Blood. Uh, Rivers of Blood. Chris, Chris <laughs> Petty. <laughs> Chris I don't Petty. know why we, we did a Ben Rivers episode and we were very, very drunk and I think we were a bit rude about him. I, you know, but he's an artist filmmaker. He's, but he, yeah, does he's, yeah, he's it's in a like, So really. we, we can't... The thing is, Spell to Order for the Darkness is good. 
Like I like that film. I don't like it, but you okay, like it, so I that's like fine. It. But so that's that's his closest he's come to yeah. making a kind of conventional, as it were, a conventionally unconventional feature film. Yeah. And I think it's good. You don't like it, whatever. Um, Patrick Keeler, really interesting. Andrew Cotting, uh, and this is why I messaged you last night about it. I was like, I'm not sure how I feel about Andrew Cotting. And I was like, actually sat with it for a while. I think for me, he just e- emblemizes that kind of Stuart Lee, Stoke Newton, camera dad, Peter Bradshaw, and they're all mates anyway, mm. uh, kind of cringe, like, you know, art film for slightly embarrassed uh, dads who still think they're cool and they're still trying to get into their Ramon shirt, even though it doesn't quite <laughs> fit over there. You're drifting Bellies. into coffee pasta here. But I yes. am, but it, I kind of am in a way, but yeah. there's, a, there's a sense where, you know, Andrew Cotting, I think... Gall- Gallivant is his very first film from like 93 or whatever is like quite well regarded and I think it's fine like whatever but uh, you know subsequently it was just like the the kind of like cringe annoying influence of people like Ian Sinclair over this kind of this pall of you know psychodrography that mm. landed over British film I think is P- Patrick Killer took a slightly with London and Robinson in Ruins and Robinson in Space, you know, that, that amazing trilogy of yeah. films that really captured a moment about British culture were not dogmatic. They were like... Um, Similar to Culloden, they like yeah. allowed their subject matter to sort of flourish. Yeah, they allowed the subject matter to flourish. They, were sh- they estranged it in lots of interesting yeah, ways. Yeah, they created this enchantment around quite yeah. banal stuff. That's what's exciting about it. And, yeah, they use, and they use that patrician voice. I mean, he literally uses Paul Schofield, who, who, who plays King Lear in, in yeah. Peter Brooks' film of it. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, they, uh, Patrick Killer's great. Like, we both love Patrick Killer. We shag Patrick Killer. He's great. But, you know, sometimes, the, yeah. Sometimes. Very boring in Q&A is actually, I have to say. Really, really so boring. We don't totally shag Because he's one of these, like, boring Wired magazine subscribing dads. Anyway, um, <laughs> but there are, so, so to quickly dismiss with that group of people, uh, yeah. Ben Rivers is an artist. You know that's where he made made his bed. He, Are we he running through caveats? I should also we should also mention like Black Audio Film Collective and John Confrere. Oh God, who, yeah, uh, so again, I don't you know like it's just it's it uh, like Harmonsworth songs and stuff is like re- is like basically just more realism documentary. John Confrere is another one, another another filmmaker who has basically made their bed with the art world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which, which doesn't mean we would dismiss it, right? Like if it, no. it has some of it is is somewhat cinematic, but I don't. Yeah, I don't find it. It makes it harder to situate them in all of this. Yeah, I don't find it like cinema. I love it. I don't find it cinephilic cinema. But also when but you're making a film that's, that's designed for you to kind of wander into a gallery and walk out again, yeah. it's not a film anymore. A film is something where you sit down in a seat and watch it until it's over. Yeah, although we yeah. did mention on the film was good. But I th- those were those are designed for screenings, aren't they? The they're screening. Discussion. You don't walk yeah. out. You don't wander in and walk out yeah. in a London film scope film. My you know, critique, because they're so short. My critique <laughs> more of those films is that they're they're like sort of educational or like they have some sort of social function, much like the free cinema stuff. So mm. not particularly interested in getting into that. <laughs> um, then there's yeah, then there's the artist film world, which of the of the like noughties, like Ben Riv- like going into the teens, Ben Rivers and Co. There's there's some stuff in there that's like essayistically poetic, but yeah, I think the pinnacle of like British es- British art essay film is Patrick Keats London. That's like as good as it gets, and that is an amazing film um, that I return to throughout my life. Um, so if we're not jumping ahead too quickly, because we aren't, we have chronologically gone through British film. We've run entirely. it We've run yeah. Well, you basically arrive at the noughties and the teens, <coughs> where you know, there are these kind of one-off people, like Peter Strickland makes an amazing film called Captain Varga, and then the rest of his career is kind of like cranky, oh, nostalgic shit, films yeah. about, you know, Giallo or whatever. Um, about Europe. Um, and, you know, someone who just basically gets an inheritance and like runs away and makes a film and it turns out to be good, unlike probably a hundred other people who did and it didn't. You get the, 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 the dread hand of Ben Wheatley. Yeah, have people like That's Ben. This yeah, kind yeah. of like kitchen sink revivalism, but what Ben Wheatley does with a bit of folk horror, bit of folk yeah. horror. He basically m- crosses the streams. He's like, "What can I do with the <laughs> kitchen sink?" Yeah, I'll just okay. We're going to do both at the same time. You know, field in England, uh, dead man's boots, dead man's yeah. shoes, sorry, whatever. You know, he's doing dead man's shoes. Is Shane Meadows, no, it's Shane Meadows. Sorry, yeah. I'm so we my have streams. Shane Meadows, who is a, a, a just another revivalist, a sort of more brutal re- revivalist of. Realism. We also have um, Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie. Earlier. We sort of skipped over that because it interests us so little. But um, there's one like yes. shining, shining beacon of the kind of tough guy British cinema, which is of course Sexy Glazer. Beast by Glazer, who yeah. then just goes, leaves Britain and makes more interesting films. 
I like Six Feet. But well, he, actually, no, he then makes the, Birth, the, which under, is Under the Skin, is interesting and it's a, a yeah. British film. And although kind of American finance with Americans, like he uses yeah. Glasgow in Under the Skin may as well be like uh, Warsaw or something. I mean, or it, LA. It, yeah, it really doesn't like. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't exude Britishness, although he is British and it although, has a you sort know, of interesting formal. Glazer is an interesting one because he's not really made that many films. Uh, he's a he's a uh, had a lot of debates about uh, Glazer, how we situate him. Um, you know, we talk about him as being the 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 absolute ad man in a way because every film yeah. completely stands apart. Every it's film like, meets a certain brief. Yeah, very well. But he's good. You know, obviously we loved. Um, Love is probably the wrong word to say. We loved the sort of interest. I think yeah, it's fantastic. we were very, very enthusiastic about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but so there are certain films, but what, what you see with British filmmaking is the rise of the cathartic, feel good Richard Curtis uh, mm-hmm. film. And then you have like this kind of underbelly of like representation, like gangster representational film, like Noel Clark. I don't, you have mm-hmm. like, films, like just in, on a demographic level, things that will be forgot, films that will be massively forgotten in decades to come. Yeah. But just in recent history of film, like British film is very much like aimed, like at particular demographics about trying to get certain people into cinema. You have like, you know, US backed uh, mainstream pap like Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, you have like, like underground films for youths like you know adult adulthood or whatever. Kidhood. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have and then you have like occasional like the BFI will do some art house stuff. Mostly it will be social realism. Mm. But then occasionally yeah they'll bring in like an odd first feature by someone like Mark Jenkin or <laughs> Peter Strickland. <laughs> Uh, Bait, yeah, yeah. So you know, as we've Mark said, Jenkins, we, we talked about he fell off after Bait. Bait was good. It was a promising. Peter Strickland, we talked about he fell off after uh, Cotton and Parker. What, you, what you but do? Joanna Hogg is the only goodie. I mean, technically, yeah. she fell off because she never made a film quite as amazing as Unrelated. But mm. she's still a very, apart from Eternal Daughter, which is atrocious, she's still like a really important figure. I think. Well, but she Unrelated makes, is like the last masterpiece of British cinema. It is, yeah. Which is quite a long time ago now. She makes Archipelago, which is good. It's competent, but it doesn't have the kind of uh, emotional tenor or, or tension yeah, it doesn't have the raw things. like and and she loves world cinema i mean she mm. loves ozu i don't love ozu but you know she gets what she needs to get from ozu um yeah, lindsay anderson loved ozu as well <laughs> mr ozu mr <laughs> ozu mr ozu mr wazo <laughs> um um she loves roma she loves bergman she loves bresson she knows what she's talking about yeah and then um, souvenir one and two were master they're a masterpiece like that like consider it one film like souvenir is extraordinary it's like really unexpected i was so vibed but i'm so yeah, ju- i i i didn't I, like i in the re in the retrospect of Part cinema, uh, souvenir part two I mm. felt less enthusiastic but if like, we listened back to our review we both fucking loved it it was so refreshing to see a British film that was w- operating at the level of every other country's best filmmaking you yeah know, you look at you look at France you go even now you know we talked a lot about the new wave earlier but now you still got like Claire Denis Bruno Dumont for example and Gaspar Noé yeah yeah, yeah. in like, France that's just three three names pulled out of a hat who uh, Catherine Brea I mean she's very old now but yeah Brea you know fantastic Brea's filmmaking. last film was extraordinary you know you begin to think you know why can't it's not like the culture in France is so diametrically opposed to culture in uh, the UK that they can't produce films like this you know and it's not like they've even remained static you know Bruno Dumont has shifted he, he's changed his clothes many times in his career Gaspar Noé has as well you know if you compare like Love to Vortex yeah, yeah totally different films you know their aesthetic sensibilities are really different also Mia um, Hansen Love coming through I mean there Mia are Hansen like Love, there yeah. are like I think French cinema is probably in, in a really in healthy total, place, I think. Oh, I was going to say it's probably uh, tailed off. I think it's a really healthy <laughs> some, place. Some people report that it's like not, I mean... Ports of its death uh, are exaggerated. <laughs> yeah, I think I think there probably aren't as many great French films being released as there were like 30 years ago. No, true, but true. there are definitely like way more great yeah, French films coming out every year than there like are. I mean, people don't fall in love in the UK. It's not like people don't have dementia in the UK. It's not like people don't have... Uh, I mean, when we make films about dementia, they're unbearable. Yeah, um, but there is like there is a feeling that, uh, you know, this comes back to the thing we said right at the beginning, right at the top of the show, which was that we are punching under our weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we'll probably begin to pick into that a little bit more. But there's certain things we've missed. Yeah. Oh, we missed. Meandering journey. We I thought we got everything in. We have to go right back to 1930. Oh, yeah. We have to go to Borderline. And talk about Borderline. Mm. Borderline the, personality the disorder. <laughs> disorder. The, so Borderline, it was produced by the Pool Group. Um, Steve Who you quoted. Yeah, so so McPherson was a director. So he worked with 
Hilda Doolittle, so HD, mm-hmm. uh, and and Paul Robeson. Um, on this film, it's a shortish film, 40, 50, 60 minutes long. Um, it's set in Switzerland because the Paul group were based in Switzerland, but, you know, he was eminently a British filmmaker from Britain. He mm-hmm. wrote about British cinema like, aggressively close up. The magazine was based um, or, or consistently spoke about British film. You know, it's a British film product, you know, maybe an, uh, maybe a colony of Britain. Um, and like Borderline is a expressive, really fresh and daring um, love triangle. It's like Ben Sofa in Russia, which was around the same time um, with, my, you know, Mayakovsky. And Sh- no, Victor, sorry, Victor Shlovsky wrote um, Ben Sofa or co-wrote it. Don't get your Mayakovsky mixed getting up Mayakovsky's. with Victor Shlovsky. It's there's Mayakovsky's. one person I know who, who wouldn't be seeing doing, dead doing <laughs> that. It's uh, all right. I feel bad, but so borderline is a really like in it, like I encourage you to go and ch- uh, chase it down. It's like a really fresh, innovative, strange. It's a strange. The editing he uses the thing clatter montage. Clatter the montage. editing is just amazing. Fuego. It's so fresh. The composition is incredible. It's very estranging. This clatter montage is like super fast cycling through shots, so fast that it kind of produces a in eye form of superimposition because your yes. eye is like lagging behind the images. So they kind of start for but it does also like posing on your it, eye. It it's creates amazing. rhythm in the frame. Yeah. Um it reminds me a bit of like uh Jermaine Delac or Maya Darren maybe. Yeah. Like it, it it reminds me of that moment before people knew how to film things. And it's skilled do- amateurs. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me that like people would never dream, I feel especially not in Britain, of like getting together a bunch of actors and then filming the well, scene. Isn't it so funny when like Lindsay Anderson's right. like, we didn't care about technique. Thing is like, McPherson and Dulac didn't really care about technique. They were just like, I don't really, they were like, I'm not like a calcified instrument of film. So maybe this can be done. Maybe we can do this, you know. Yeah, but they were asking questions about technique. They were asking questions, whereas Lindsay Anderson yeah. wasn't really asking questions about technique. Yeah, he's he like, was I just, just don't like care. Putting the camera as, as sort yeah. of, yeah. He was, he was interested in immediacy. He was interested in doing mm. away with mediation because I think on some mm. level he thought mediation was bourgeois. Mm. That's Whereas what I find more. so interesting about the, like the Lindsay Anderson, Peter Goodall line is mm. like, you know, Lindsay Anderson thought mediation was bourgeois. Peter Goodall thought that like not... Like like mediation was was a was a, a way to like oppose the bourgeois, mm. but like and yeah, because Peter Goodall thought that if people watched his films, that it would help to dismantle ideology, mm. you know, which is an incredible thing to make, say. It's I mean, like, to be honest, everyone who watches his films is a Marxist, yeah, but I true. think there's chicken and egg, isn't it? Yeah, it's very chicken <laughs> and egg. Um, <laughs> but borderline, borderline's fantastic, and it's like it shows the promissory of a way, a direction that British filmmaking could have got in. Um, and, you know, you look at it, and if you look at it alongside a real, like, one of the most cited films ever, and yeah. one of these, like, films that really doesn't deserve Laura's I guess, Chien Andalou. Oh, um, yeah. The Chien Andalou's sh- shit. It's the like, dog on the loo. Yeah, the dog on the loo. It's really not a good, a good or interesting film. The thing is, Borderline... It's a very Mark Como joke there. Yeah, it really I'm, was. I'm so sorry. I'm being your mayo to the your <laughs> ketchup. But, um, Mark Ketchup and mayo. Um, <laughs> but basically what happens is, you know, you look at a film like Borderline. Borderline is, like, leagues better than you know, I, know, I hate to say things like better but it's like a much no, more accomplished is. cogent why do you hate to say things like better we're critics that's yeah, like our true. whole job but better is like <laughs> a co- say better what does that mean but I'm saying no, it's, it's more cogent it's more realised it's, it's more, more imaginative I mean like more imaginative it's less sloppy as well. as it's just like watching the mighty boosh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's so random oh, it's crazy you know, flies in your hand whereas like mm. Um, uh, borderline is just about like a love triangle, and it's told in a really interesting way. And because it reflects yeah. interiority, like the characters in it, they're not coded as middle class or bourgeois. They, we we have to believe that they're like working class. One of them is a black. Two of them are black. Yeah, people. actually, it's not not about like identity and, and yeah. like it's not not about that. Like there's this whole. that's deeply confected <laughs> you know and kind of like uh, and it's just reproducing theatre ultimately yeah I think that's it so I think who else have we missed what we've missed is we've missed big dog Peter Greenway I don't 
I don't care about Greenway. Do you not care about Greenway? I think we should talk about you, him. You talk about what you think is important about Greenway. Okay, so Greenway... I think he's overrated. Greenaway is really interesting because Greenaway is a European um, in a lot of ways, right? Like he lives in the Netherlands. He lives in the Netherlands. He, he left the UK a long time ago, but he, early in his career, he makes two films. He makes the Draftsman's Contract and he makes The Fools. Uh, like the Draftsman's Contract is late 70s, The Fools is what, 80? And these are part of the TV, the sort of 80s TV, Channel 4, Film 4. They're B- film films. BFI. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but they're like, they like drama and they come out of this. Yeah, they come out of, of, a s- of funding. Funding that's not commercial funding. Yeah, and they presumably are, none of these films really make their money back, but they also make. Quite I shouldn't cheaply. imagine. So. Yeah, yeah. So but they, they like, are, like Sally Potter. So what you got with Drafts? I think Drafts' contract is extraordinary. It's very funny. Uh, it's a period drama. Um, it's, it's like an Elan comedy. I feel kind of yeah. It's a, it's a bit like I mean it's the very fav- it's a bit like the favorite. I think it was yeah. I think it, it, it's better than the favorite. It, obviously, it's but. way better. I think it, I, I think um, <laughs> I'm trolling that. <laughs> I think Drafts' I contract like ran though. so that. Yorgos Lanthimos' favorite could, could kind of stumble st- into a ditch, yeah. yeah. But um, it has this kind of like hot, uh, declarative uh, mannerism. It's very interesting. It's very funny. I love, like, the Dawson Contract is a film you start watching and thinking, this is going to be hard work. And you watch it and, you, and you're like, I fucking love this. It's so good. It's, it's such a good film. And it has a sort of structural element because the narrative takes place across these various a series of drawings. Drawings, effectively. Yeah. Um, or, or compositions uh, and then he makes The Fools which is a kind of linguistic film in a way it's a kind of post-apocalyptic it's a bit like Threads yeah I think like it's in the, the same Fools, I started purpose. watching The Fools full disclosure I didn't watch it all it's, it's like three and a half hours but it's really long um, <laughs> The Fools is like everything I don't like about Peter Watkins it's like a voiceover telling you stuff but it's like a, it like steps over the line of, of enchanting what it's showing and then it just like becomes it's almost like a Monty Python it sketch. It is very Monty python But it doesn't yeah. have any sense of humor. It's just like, this man, uh, after the horrible, disgusting, violent event, uh, decided to do this or whatever. And it's like, what are you He talking? later turned into a bird. But yeah, like was determined that he was not a bird <sighs> at all. Uh, it's, I, l- I like it, but okay. I will be Shut colored up. by the fact that I think when I watched it, I drank seven to eight beers okay. during the course of it. So I think my enjoyment was probably related to the fact of my intoxication during the Okay, process. so if you want to enjoy a British film, drink six to seven. We days. have a substance. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alcohol. <laughs> Intoxicate yourself. As much as possible. Um, you will No, I think I feel think something. I think then actually Greenaway does continue occasionally to make interesting films. So he makes Belly of an Architect, which I think is extraordinary. I actually haven't seen this one. It's really fucking good. It is really, really okay. good. Um I should have watched that as research. He's thing is it's shot in Italy um, uh, has an American crack because light to the main characters in America. What about the cook, the thief, his cock, and his willy? What? <laughs> oh God, yeah. What's the actual name of that? Helen film? Mirren, when Michael Gambon. Like that's for fun. That's a fun film it's to watch, fun. but like, it's not like it's a bit of a play. What, and it's what, a bit silly. What I like about actually Greenaway is his his sinking towards film. So he's a big he's a big spectacle guy. He's not really interested in like clean beauty in a way. One of the things he said that uh, I found very influential when I was like starting out in film I suppose was he was like it's really important for filmmakers to embrace like new technologies and not to feel beholden or fetishized to you know certain technologies of the past so he meant film so he was an er early adopter of digital he's you know messed around with like 3D various things he's like if it's a cinematic tool I'm going to try and make it work Mm. Uh, if it looks a bit ugly or weird whatever I, I like that. I like that about him. Like he's he's really interested in moving image, um, yeah. As a medium, and he's aware of its capacity. He's never been that interesting in editor. I think it's he's yeah. More he the also guy, there's just this quote I sent to you by him where he's yeah, I like get that quote. where he says like Godard and Scorsese now modify. We're never interested in the visual element of cinema, which I find really odd. Which is not true. And then he like acts like he was when like uh, so many of his films are based on. But like, he is uh, like using text yeah. really heavily to. But he thinks what he's he, it's a false <laughs> it's a false dichotomy. It's really odd. It's like film film isn't vision. Photography is vision. Film is editing. You know, film film, film is, is time unfolding. Image. This yeah. is what moving Tarkovsky image. was so correct about. Yeah. Is it sculpting in time? F- film, the yeah. one thing that you can like do with fil- with film that you can't do with any other medium is you can watch time unfold. You know, you you can watch the leaves rustle in the tree. You know, or you can st- watch the leaves rustle and then cut to a lake. Exactly. Yeah, you can go. You can yeah. jump around. You can do. And some people yeah. are extremely restrained in like, like how much of that they do. 
but essentially like that's the exciting thing you do and and you can tell even if even if you shoot a play with a bit of like with a bit of like nice blocking or whatever mm. you're still not really getting you're still not kurosawa you're still not really getting around the fact that like you need to embrace the material like the depth and you know you, like you need to not be relying on words Mm. To, t- to tell your story or to uh, communicate the feeling or to whatever it is you, you're trying to do even yeah. if you're just minimally trying to create like an experience you're not gonna you can use words but you're not gonna powerfully commu- you know uh, convey that experience if you're but relying primarily on words exactly and I think you know British films often struggle to disentangle itself from its reliance on words its reliance on language its reliance on theatre um, so you know it hasn't got that kind of sweet generous emergence of real filmmakers who are setting out to make film not adapt novels not adapt plays not mm-hmm. film plays to actually make things that are designed for film um you know and it's like all the elements were there in 18 88, 88. when round hay garden scene there was no scripts with round hay garden scene there was nah, it's the, it's the best british film this one should the be in our, in our list um, so, okay. can I make a point of order? Because I think we've basically done the history now. Yeah, we have. We've recorded for two hours. Jesus. We've done the history. We're now going to do a summary, the two summary TikToks, where we'll recap ourselves a little bit. Okay, we're going to kneecap ourselves. You ready? <laughs> you ready for this? Okay. So, I, I have a list of five things, two lists of five things. Um, And we're going to just like... uh it'll be easier for the edit if we just like wax a little bit Mm. on these topics here are five reasons why we think the British films are not very good social realism there has been an obsession with reflecting life as it is who are we talking about here Ken Loach Carol Rice and then later you get kind of Shane Meadows Andrea Arnold it's a symptom of our obsession with class making sure that we know that poverty exists the dialogue is very on the nose always the desire for representation on its own Mm. leads to boring filmmaking decisions superficial number two british films rely too much on the british heritage of the written word british playwrights have had a major influence on the world you know from shakespeare marlowe down to tom stoppard and there's a belief that we can one for one transliterate that into film often by just adapting those plays this goes deep it goes back to the birth of cinema i think the british basically thought this will be an opportunity to do plays to do books to do the things that we're already good at that doesn't mean that you don't do dialogue, right? There are many great filmmakers like Roma and stuff who are full of dialogue. All dialogue. Yeah. But the dialogue is not given this like insane importance. What's point number three? Lack of like interest in formal techniques of film. Film is inherently a moving image medium. It's about editing, composition, how something looks. British film largely hasn't been interested in that. Uh, it's a preoccupation with what the film is about uh, rather than how the film is made. Number four. Uh, America steals from us and we don't steal enough from America. Tons of British directors, good and bad, have very quickly fled our shores. Chaplin, Hitchcock, Ridley Scott, uh, Nick Rowe, Jonathan Glazer more recently. Meanwhile, a lot of our IP, our intellectual property, is exported over there. Harry Potter was filmed in Elstree Studios. These are not British films, they're kind of global products. Our audiences aren't used to watching British films and so they don't desire British films. And this has been the case since the very early silent era. Basically, we don't learn enough from the world, from world cinema, whether that's in the way Godard learnt from Westerns by Anthony Mann and John Ford, or whether it's just looking at European art house cinema. Point five. Hit it. We don't fund it and we don't value it. We don't have a kind of bedrock of homegrown talent or the kind of like institutions that can nourish and finance those people. There's no money there. Thousands of people you're in competition with for a couple of pots of small pots of money. Very small pots of money that allow you to shoot for maybe three days. We've had small spurts of fi- self-financed experimentation which have really struggled to survive. We need to give loads of money to young people to make films. Here are five films which you might not have seen which represent the best of British cinema. Number one. Borderline. It's a love triangle starring Paul Robeson. It actually talks about identity um, and belonging and racial tension and sexual ambiguity. It's shot in a very fresh, dynamic way, the clatter montage. It, it feels like aligned with like the American avant-garde that we see in, in Maya Darren, but it also feels quite aligned with like what Hitchcock becomes known for, the yeah. way he places emphasis on objects. So number two is uh, Peter Watkins' Culloden. Imagine an 18th century battle shot like a kind of newsreel with talking heads. It also uses the kind of patrician British mm. media voice, the Radio 4 voice, yeah. to uh, tell you about the hypocrisy of the British establishment. 
Yeah. Number three, oh. Elephant by Alan Clark, who narrowly avoids many of the pitfalls of British cinema, even though he's often working with plays, even though he's often using socially realist subject matter. He still, in many of his films, including and especially Elephant, manages to tell stories originally. Elephant it depicts a series of killings, decontextualized killings, that we are aware as the audience are a, an expression of the troubles. It's a chilly, very violent um, film that stands apart from its subject matter. It does not really reflect the interiority of its characters. It sports Alan Clark's signature technique of the steady cam. And it's a very affecting film. It's not an easy watch. Number four is Patrick Keeler's London. It expresses through static shots of various places, including the Thames, Elephant and Castle, the East End. It has a an overarching narrative, which is a dialogue about Robinson, who is a wandering metropolitan academic. It gives voice to something that I think a lot of us feel, and I think it maybe is symptomatic that it's one of the best British films because it's about how much British people uh, with any intelligence want to disavow the things that our country signifies yeah. and the fact that we are still trapped in all these tropes and all these conventions and in a, a deeply reactionary politics. Number five will be Unrelated by Joanna Hogg. As with many of these films, is a kind of probing of class. It's about a woman who turns up late to a holiday and manages yet to become the centre of the drama, ends up kind of disturbing the family unit. It's very intimate. It takes its influence from the best of world cinema, Bresson, Roma. It's understated in perhaps quite a British way. It's filmed on a mini DV camera with only static shots. So to round off this discussion, yeah, you've, you've, been li you've been listening to... Actually, our, our London Film Festival episode was this long as well. So I think people are prepared to come for the ride. This is a real... People will leave, they'll resume this, pause it, resume it. You know, this, you know is, a, say, this is a real mission statement like for us. I feel like people can start this on Saturday night. Yeah. Finish <laughs> Sunday morning. morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm terrible, terrible, uh, terrible. Um, so I, I, this was all inspired by an article I wrote and never published um, called The Problem of British Cinema. Yeah. And uh, I feel like I'm better at podcasting than writing. So we just did a podcast. Uh, maybe I'll publish a shortened version of it somewhere. You have a substack, uh, technically. Oh, God, yeah. No, but I don't think we've renamed it. It's still called Moob Tube. Terrible. Oh, yeah. um, but anyway, we, um, I started this essay with a quote from Godard. <coughs> and then I wrote my own conclusion. Um, I'm going to read out the Godard quote and then I'm going to read my conclusion Great. and then I'll throw to you for a final thought mm. how have the descendants of Daniel Defoe, Thomas Hardy George Meredith reached such a degree of incompetence in matters of art it really is enough to make one despair except that to despair of British cinema would be to admit that it exists I would dismiss Godard's haughty taunting if it didn't ring so painfully true as a British filmmaker myself, I pen this prognosis not out of vitriol, but because each problem of British cinema contains the key to something better. As with any former empire, it requires unlearning a few of our myths. Britain is neither gritty nor magic, nor is it America, nor is a film similar to a novel or a play. Britain is a beautiful country, ravaged like most by capitalism, and bent double with status anxiety. Nothing in our landscape should prohibit us from Wellesian spectacle, or Tarkovsky and tranquility. Nothing in our culture should preclude passionate romance or thrilling suspense. If we could embrace film's possibilities as a medium, not our own obsessions and traditions, then, as Peter Wallen hoped in 1963, British cinema might forget that it is British and remember, once and for all, that it is cinema. So true. Far be it from us to kind of make prognoses about national character and how much they influence. But, uh, you know, national character doesn't exist, but there are material conditions that produce us and that affects our sense of interiority and identity and our subjectivity. We are formed that by which the culture. creates national character. Yeah, so which it does exist. So but it's only exist. a result of these things. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, it's not inherent. It is yeah, produced yeah. by certain material factors yeah, yeah. and economic factors that reinforce us and obviously that's going to shape the kinds of films we make and the, the kind of uh, explorations of identity make you know the idea of uh, god imagine english nostalgia oh the tarkovsky film yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah imagine imagine it would just be some it would just it's be, impossible it would to be conceive, some you know. it'd be ian sinclair just doddering yeah. around in a ditch and, uh, <laughs> he's trying to like Hanwell or something he's rather than trying to light a candle he's trying to open his he's trying to open like a kind of like organic nut bar <laughs> Whilst walking across Clapham Common, he's like, oh, I can't. Yeah. No, one more time. Come on in. It's so <laughs> ordinary, <laughs> so homemade. Yeah, it's ho um, homespun. It's a it's a co cottage industry basically. Exactly. I think that's kind of one of the the defining characteristics of it. And it's like, but it would be so nice, you know. And we're like, yeah, we can go and get, but we may not have 
steak at home. Yeah, we can go and get steak elsewhere. We can go and watch um, the new wave, and we can go and watch Tarkovsky and whatever. And we can go and watch Kislowski in Poland. The thing is, it would be really nice to feel like our reality was represented in interesting, <coughs> interesting, and kind of like slightly deranged ways. Yeah, and there's also like mm. fuck all money for anything interesting there's right no now. There's no money, but there's loads of cameras and loads of um, people wanting mm. better stuff to happen. Yeah, um, and that's really the point, and that's really like what I do all this for is because I do believe things can get better. <laughs> things can only get better. That's it. They they can get worse, things but um, but but we we've we've better. charted it. We've charted a few. Um, we're not going to do Blair Cinema. But we've we've uh, and certainly not going to do Starmer cinema. But um, <laughs> we have charted a few routes. All right, thank you so much for listening to our dissection, our anatomy of a of a terrible of the bloated, washed up corpse of English cinema. Um, yeah. uh, we will be back, hopefully, to discuss Larry Gottheim. Yeah, actually, we're gonna so we're gonna have Daniel Nefitu. We talked about him a little bit earlier on. We invoked him. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Larry Gottheim. Um, probably the the you know sort of like great un under you know sort of like underwritten as it were or you know sort of like a underappreciated American avant garde filmmaker who had a, has had you know a massive influence on American film is really one of the most important voices still alive and kicking unlike everyone else in yeah. American experimental cinema um, so yeah hopefully that's coming up soon beyond that we don't quite know yeah we're not going to any festivals you can't afford to and all the festivals are um, yeah. Zionist now apparently so. Yeah, we're not doing that. I think I don't know. Uh, so we're just gonna we're just gonna watch films at home, yeah, for free, and then talk <laughs> about them like we like we always did. All right. Cheers to a better future. Uh, things can only get better. <laughs> <laughs>